Very good morning. Then I'll kick off the, the, the workshop. This is the second edition of the consent workshop. Consent second international workshop on consent management in online services, networks, and things. So a venue to discuss everything about consent, which is a very complicated problem, very multi and cross discipline. And we've got very, very interesting papers that precisely reveal the, the, the nature of the of the the, the problem um since I, this is a one-day workshop um we've got three papers uh the first one on conciseness interests and unexpectedness user attitudes towards infographic and comic consent mediums this is actually reminds me of the paper of a paper last year on the first edition of the workshop where privacy notices could perhaps be shown as um, comics. Uh, there's good things, there's not so good things about it, but it's certainly a very, very valid um, approach. The second paper, internalization of privacy externalities through negotiation, social costs of third party web analytic tools and the limits of the legal data protection framework. It's a even more interesting paper, I find it uh, very, very, um, how can I say, um, very informative. Myself, how, as someone with a background in computer science, cybersecurity, privacy, that kind of lines, this paper looks at consent from a using economic theories. This is very, very valuable, very, very interesting, very, very, I'm very, very much looking forward to it. We'll have a lunch break. Then we'll have a, um, our, our third paper, a policy-oriented architecture for enforcing consent in solids and solids, um, those ideas from Tim, Tim uh, Berners-Lee. Um, 2.30, rather, yeah, 2.30, we've got our keynote from, Rob, with, uh, from Robin Burgeon, the consent of the governance. Very much looking forward to it. Um, 3.45, we have a break. 3.45, we have the panel discussion and with the generic title of the web of consent. I think everybody will agree with me that consent and um, online web, that is, is, um, is very strange. It's a very strange place to be these days. All those banners, all those complicated clicks that very, very often mean absolutely nothing including up to including very unlawful practices which means uh, in the sense of people clicking i reject yet doesn't matter this will still collect um whatever people want there's some order gdpr ccpa um all over the world there's new data protection regulations coming up it's putting some order yet something is clearly failing um as in it's not working. I personally, yes, I did a very simple exercise, went to a newspaper in the UK. I clicked on who is on the consent banner. I actually went through the list of, uh, of vendors as they call. I picked one at random and I landed on a privacy policy in Polish. So this is absolutely, it's, it's a joke, literally. So there's lots, lots to, to be discussed. There's no clear ideas, there's no clear, well, there's, clear ideas, there's absolutely no clear solutions, nothing is obviously um, a, a successor of consent matters and, and all that. There's, however, very interesting ideas, and uh, I will be very much looking forward to hear about them. And that's it. So I think uh, I see the three authors um, here. I would Pass the stage to. I hope I'm saying the the the, the name right. Shenji Don Duan for the first paper on conciseness, interest, and unexpectedness user attitudes towards infographic and comic consent mediums. Very good morning, Shenji. Did I did I pronounce your name correctly? Um, I cannot hear. No. Okay, this is work now. Perfect. Thank Great. you very much. 
Yes, it's pronounced Yenji, like a Y sound, but thank you Yenji. for asking. Not actually that number. Okay. All right. It's yours. Great. I'll start sharing my screen. Okay. So I accidentally landed on the last slide, but let's go to the first slide now. So again, my name is Yenji Doan. I am a PhD student at the University of Luxembourg, working on trying to improve the consent process for genomic data sharing. And this is one of the research topics that I was interested in. Conciseness, interest, and unexpectedness, user attitudes towards infographic and comic consent mediums. And this was done in collaboration with other members of the SNT at the University of Luxembourg and also a collaborator at Fraunhofer SNT. So let's move on to an introduction. Consent is complicated, as many of you know, but just as a basic reminder, some of the challenges for users might include readability, understandability, engagement, and transparency. Sometimes you just get huge blocks of text that might have really complicated concepts, especially if they have things about privacy or um, things about like using very complicated terminology that might be legal, like GDPR terminology. And as well as engagement, no one likes filling out a consent form or having to deal with it. And there can also be issues with transparency of how much information is actually shown and what it means. And so here is a little comic from XKDCD about managing your preferences. So one button, you can agree to whatever. And another button, it transport me to an immersive mist-like game where I click confusingly labeled toggle switches, only some of which work, perhaps never find my way back to the page I wanted. So that just illustrates one of the ways that it can be a really complicated process. And other mediums may help the understanding aspect. For example, comics were found to be useful for communicating consent with indigenous populations. And infographics and comics may be useful in engaging and being effective for memory retention as just a general way of communicating information. There are also other mediums such as video with an audio element or being able to even use both and more than one medium to communicate consent. And for my, my topic to, of health data, consent is especially important. For example, health data is highly sensitive. There's high risk of re-identification and that directly implicates someone's privacy because their health information is generally immutable and really difficult to change. So shown below is a graph of known privacy attacks in genomic data sharing. And so, there are some things that can happen that I don't expect anyone to actually read, but just wanted to share that there's a lot of information that can be derived from more general information that someone might not think is very um, insecure or private about themselves. So for example, one of the little things on the bottom is that there can be an inference of predisposition to Alzheimer's disease despite masking the information. And so that's um, masking some of the more sensitive parts of the genome that might actually um, indicate some of this disease. But even though there's been papers that have shown that it's still possible to uncover that again. And one of the interesting things is that EU data trustees can uncomplicate things for health data. Data trustees are an independent steward between those who provide data and those who process that data. And this has been suggested in the EU data strategy for data, as well as in the Data Governance Act and the health data space as a really central way of trying to make the process a lot easier for people. And it's in the vision for the next five to 10 years. And in the use case of health data, for example, data trustees can assist in finding suitable participants for clinical trials in a privacy-friendly manner, where the individuals themselves transfer their data to a data trustee in exchange for benefits. And then the data trustee, then in a more private way, can 
pass on specific levels of information to organizations that intend to carry out clinical trials. And so now we move on to the research questions. So we are interested in what are participants' general experiences with the informed consent process to get a better understanding of them. And then our second question is about considering the language design content and document fit with the reader, what are participants' expectations prior to exposure to different consent mediums? What are their preferences after exposure to consent mediums of the infographic and comic medium and why? What are elements that influence their engagement with the infographic and comic medium? And what kind of emotions do the infographic and comic medium trigger? So to do this, we carried out semi-structured interviews, and this was with the help of our collaborator at Fraunhofer SIT in Germany. So our demographics are actually about the uh, cross-section of the German adult population. So we had 24 participants with an even represent representation of ages in these three age brackets from 18 to 90, male and female sex, and we're interested in educational level as well. So we also have an even representation of participants where their highest degree was a school leaving certificate or an apprenticeship, and their highest degree was from a college or university. So in this study, we verbally presented participants with a fictional use case where they imagined that they were contacted by a data trustee to obtain consent for the transfer of their data to a service provider who wants to invite them to a clinical trial. They're presented with the full consent text, so just plain text, and then asked about their previous expectations with consent and their expectations in the future. Then they're shown a subsection of that consent form in five different mediums and asked for rankings, emotions, and if their expectations were met. And in this presentation, we're just going to compare the comic and the infographic where the highest and lowest ranks. And I'll show what this full consent looked like in German next. So they have this different sections that have who are we, what data do we process, and where do we get it from, what happens if I agree, and what exactly do we want consent for today. And we stress that we were only trying to understand the engagement of a specific subsection of this due to time constraints where we're asking many questions as well as showing them five different mediums and then asking follow-up questions all in about one hour. And so we chose to only show them one subsection. So this is what it looked like for the infographic. This was highest right by our participants. We have this top section of what happens if I agree with a very clear step-by-step -step flow of numbers that have, of they will be contacted, they'll have a medical checkup, and what will happen if they actually consent. We have these very clear headings as well as these icons to reinforce the text and some other graphic elements on the bottom and top to add interest. Next, we have the comic, which was lowest ranked by a participant. And here we focused both on graphic elements, but more about a narrative and characters. For example, we have a doctor character and a participant character, as well as having a not a step-by-step -step flow, but a structured flow where you know the story begins with the beginning and ends with the ending, and you can't just jump around to different sections. Now we'll go through the results. So when participants reported their prior experience with consent, it was really interesting to see their self-reported time spent on consent, with most of the participants saying that they would spend about one to five minutes and then the next most commonly stated time was zero to 30 seconds. And this was also highly context dependent as we realized when they really explained themselves. So they would say with cookies, I immediately refuse as much as possible. At the doctor's office, for example, I would read through a consent form twice. And this was true for some other participants as well. So when we really dug into their reasoning for why they would spend a specific amount of time, um, it was really interesting to see that participants stated that they would spend as long as necessary to understand. But this was followed by just spending enough time to sign. And then the third most common reasoning for 
this was trust. So if, for example, they would trust their doctor more than they would trust a website or financial institution, which they have less trust in. So we realized that it was highly context dependent and very interesting because their expectations for consent though were very specific. So for example, they wanted graphic elements such as bullet points, highlighting and headings for skimming because they didn't want to spend all of the time to understand everything, but just to understand what was most important to them as well as textual directness and conciseness of the sentences for readability, as well as a fit to themselves as the audience for their skills and demographics for the German adult population. And they also wanted relevant information for themselves as participants to be able to understand how to prioritize their decision-making. And here I'm going into the preferences for the infographic and comic. So we compare the rank, from one to five on um, here, from one to five, as well as the reasoning here and some of the main elements that were cited by participants. And we have the number of participants and their ranking. So for infographic, we have a lot of participants citing that it helped enable better understanding, it helped save them time, it helped them prioritize, and it helped grab their interest. And this is contrasted with the comics who did have some high rankings as well as some medium rankings and some low rankings, but there was no clear way that their rankings were related to a specific reasoning. For example, we have four people that said that comics help with their understanding, but they ranked it fifth because it was behind other mediums of consent. And so from this, we can see that the infographic was more widely accepted and helped um, across a lot of different people and they all had really similar ways of interpreting the infographic. An interesting point too is that um, the infographic also garnered a lot more responses for participants. So remember we have 24 participants but actually um, we have 48 coded segments which means that within the interview, there were 48, um, for example, reasonings that would pop up from what participants said. So they wouldn't just say one, sometimes they would say two, they would say three, one person would say one. And so um, this is highly contrasted to the comic, which has a much lower number of responses for how their reasoning is impacting the ranking. And so one of these, as we dive into the negatives of the comic is that they were heavily disliked because of the relationship criteria, in particular, the audience fit and the tone. So this participant said, I'm out of the age where I still like comics. I don't feel like I'm being taken seriously as a customer with a consent form like this. And this goes into the emotions that really left. So sorry, this is <laughs> Should not be there. But so the comic had the top three emotions of surprise, disapproval, interest, and distraction. And the infographic had the top four um, emotions as anticipation, interest, acceptance, and surprise. And then acceptance and surprise were tied, so I put both of them there. And surprise can be a, post, a positive and a negative emotion, while as disapproval and distraction are quite negative and interest is positive. Whereas Infographic also had surprise, which can be positive or negative, but in general, the other three emotions were positive. And so now I'm going just into some of the limitations and then future work and conclusions. So some of the limitations are that we had a small sample size of just the German adult population as a cross section. And we found that context is highly dependent. So it would be really interesting to try this in other populations. And as well, the study materials, the design was created by me after lots of deliberation from other people, but it still was created by just one person. And so maybe there's some caveats of how these are created, um, employing an actual company to create them or professionals. Um, in addition, the text. So we used largely the same text, about 99% similar, but sometimes for specific modes of um, mediums, they would require maybe um, a header or an introductory sentence to fit the medium. And so there was slightly different text. And as well as the 
self-reporting aspect of, for example, self-reporting time spent on consent. I doubt anyone really thinks about how much time they spend on consent. And so that might be um, not as specific. And in general, some of our future work that we're interested in is, is contextual appropriateness. And also integrating some of this more design elements of, or recommendations for user interfaces with technical automation of consent technologies. And also working on analyzing our full interview, which includes a text, comic, infographic, newsletter, and video for future publication. And in conclusion, to summarize some of the results here, is that the infographic appears to be the most promising medium in a biomedical context, as it enables understanding, allows prioritization when reading, and raises interest and attention. And the comic, despite some positive elements, should be employed with caution as it doesn't seem like it's an appropriate audience fit and tone in the medical context, medical consent context in Germany. And so thank you all for listening and thanks to our co-collaborators, Annika, Ariana, Maria, and Gabriele, as well as other members of Annika's lab who helped with the interviewing, as well as to our funders and you for listening. So happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. I've got a few questions, personally speaking. Any questions from the audience? <clears throat> I'll ask a couple then. Um, I wonder if you could go through the infographic in particular, and tell us what it's written there, because it's German. I suspect not many people here. So I was, again, my, my poor, my very poor German, which is around zero. I was trying to make sense of the words. Uh, that and also the comic. Could you, could you just quickly go through that? Yes, I can paraphrase because I also don't know German, but I had to translate from English to German. So the first one is like, what happens if I agree? And then there's a little section of um, like, you'll be contacted. And then there'll be, I think, um, a medical exam happening. And then I think here you will, um, it's like, interestingly enough, it's easier for me to do it in this comic because it is very clearly represented, but then the stages aren't set out. So I'll actually start in the comic and then go back to the infographic. But yeah, so um, this one actually has some previous ones that says, okay, if you consent, and then those are the top two sections. And then it says, what happens if you agree? So you'll be contacted by the hospital and then the hospital will ask you to bring your documents and be able to bring them to the hospital. Then they will conduct a exam, like a checkup type of thing. And that is, I think here, there'll be an exam. And then after that, you'll be um, described the clinical trial that is happening. And there's like some information about that. And then you'll be asked to actually agree to the clinical trial or not. That's the fifth step. And then if you agree to the clinical trial, then there's some monitoring that happens, there's some reporting that happens and more work. So that's the longest part about what happens after you agree and how you're monitored for um, the future clinical trials, if you agree. Okay. Two questions and the, the, the question has also read my mind. Um, do you, so can, can this evolve, do you think? to a generic infographic or comic um, that could replace a consent dialogue, do you think? And uh, I, I would even add something else. So uh, quite a few years ago, and I think it's a pity that that idea sort of disappeared. There was this notion of icons where you attach, because really at the end of the day, GDPR at least, um, there's not much a previously notice has to say. So there's, it's fairly structured. So I wonder if we can have icons to it. I know retention and there's a symbol uh, for data being read, uh, well, uh, 
on the retention and then the number next to it in days or months or something like that. So do you think this could evolve into a generic web? Uh, on the web, I would say medical is probably more complicated. Uh, but on the web, do you think this could evolve into a generic comic or infographic that uh, even can be automated? There's just a website, we type in our precise requirements and it gen generates nice figures and, and so on, do you think? Yes, I think at least from this study, it was found that the infographic is more generally accepted and because it's a mix of text and graphics. It's not like very graphics heavy like the comic is, and it's not very text heavy like the full consent text. So I think it might be a really good option. I think some of the um, more interesting results that are sometimes in the paper, but not here, are that um, even within this infographics, just adding a lot more visual elements or elements in general like color or headings um, increase different people's um, perceptions on them. For example, um, someone thought that this thumbs up might be trying to influence their decision and change how they're feeling. But then that goes into the question of choosing the right icon and how that can be really difficult because there might not be universal icons because everyone comes from a different cultural context. Um, but then I think that if there are um, more elements that people, for example, gave us feedback on, like they said, oh, calendar's really outdated because we were showing them some videos and things they would accept. They would think about like a calendar app on a phone instead, which was really interesting to us because I think it just raises a lot more um, points where there's decisions to make, be made. So I think it would be um, something that could be automated on a very simple sense of Yes, icons can be tagged with metadata and then maybe it could be automated how they're put together with text, but then if it actually suits the context which, which it's given and the population and the demographics is a much harder question. Uh, uh, uh. Second question is, is this, does this meet, do you know, say legal requirements, especially for health data, healthcare, medical data, would this be would this be valid consent in, well, I suppose it depends on the jurisdiction, but uh, in general, would this be sufficient to show this, give time for the person to read? Uh, what do you think? Any ideas? I think that we're trying to, um, because the part that would come after is like actually signing like written consent or some type of oral consent, which is usually um, what is usually done, but I think that the level of information that we're trying to go for too is sometimes a little above and beyond what sometimes is legally mandated. Like this section is about what happens after you consent. Usually the information give it, is given is just about your consent, why they're requesting it um, and who will go to, but they don't say what will actually happen after it goes to them. And so in our, um, more general full consent text. We actually tried to have like all of these sections that were trying to be as transparent as we could be to be as legally lawful as we could. I suppose there's no actual example where this is used, right? There's no... Um... Yeah, this is um, still currently a um, example for especially for data trustees, but there are examples of consent using um, maybe multimedia and like, yeah, digital consent that for, um, for example, like medical apps or, or studies that um, do use like videos or other things and they're usually, I think, well received. Comment on the chat from a co-author, I believe. GDPR explicitly proposes visualizations as means to provide information, plus EDPV guidelines briefly discuss comics and other visual means. This is interesting. I was not completely aware of this. Um, okay, is there, is there any examples, Ariana, that, that, you, that you know of, that people actually went and instead of a bar of the wall of text like that, that's absolutely horrendous. Um, they actually used um, comics or more multimedia. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm like on the move and there are like probably words that you can hear in the background. So I hope you can hear me decently. Absolutely um, fine. Okay, okay. So hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, so actually ours was, was not something that came out of nowhere. Uh, there are examples of comics that are used, but especially to provide the information. So the data protection information, uh, then as the, uh, for example, the, the actual um, uh, request for consent, uh, I'm not entirely aware there are a few examples in terms of comics, but when it comes to visualizations, um, I think that uh, sometimes there is this kind of uh, misunderstanding on whether a text is just text and a visualization is just visualization. And it's something that Yanji also pointed at earlier, which is that we actually need to think much more th through and also to experiment with different types of combinations of text and different kinds of visualizations and all sorts of visualizations have so each visualization may have a different goal uh, so it's not only about readability it's not only about understandability it's really as uh, Yanji mentioned like text navigation skimmability um, how do you find the information what kind of logical order there is um, so yes there are certain examples what we see a lot right now of course are the privacy icons so a lot of experimentation with icons uh, lately, um, but because I think also because it, it has been explicitly mentioned and suggested in the GDPR, uh, but this doesn't mean that we cannot use other kinds of visualization um, at all. Actually, I have some examples in case that I can also share here. Um, but yeah, so it's it's absolutely legal, <laughs> according to me. Of course, uh, it must see, it must be seen uh, uh, in court if something happens. But uh, uh, it, it's it's really suggested as a means to increase transparency. It must be done right. That's the exactly. challenge. Exactly. And I also found very, very, very interesting the fact that uh, comics are not seen. Uh, well, what was the word, Genji? Uh, people didn't like comics because they, I'm going to say using my own words because I feel the same. They could be very, very helpful. They could completely explain me the situation and the context very quickly, but I will feel manipulated. <laughs> I'll feel like being treated like a child. No, no, no. So I'd rather go for the maybe the legal text because I will feel more proud of myself. So measuring the trust and uh, why people, <laughs> it was a very, very, like, very special um, uh, uh, conclusion indeed. And the second one I was, did I, I didn't quite understand. How do you measure emotions? At some point you had a, a, a list of emotions. How did you measure that? Is there... The computer science in me is absolutely fascinated by measuring emotions. Yes. So we use um, this emotion wheel from Robert Puchik, who, um, and there are many other ways of doing this. This is kind of like a social science, like human computer action way of doing it. So we would show this to the participants so that they would be able to um, be able to better categorize emotions, because I think a lot of people are able to maybe name a few, <laughs> but then this one was able to have these core emotions and then maybe less intense versions of them and then also the mixture of emotions of like annoyance and boredom as contempt and so they were shown this in German and then they could use this to reference their emotions throughout the process okay okay so was it they just pin but would they pick the, the top three kind of thing or they were allowed to, to say whatever they wanted so they could pick just one and some people were really interesting. They said, oh, it makes me feel kind of yellow, very serene. They would reference the color and then say the name. Or sometimes they would just be like, OK, I feel these three. And these are what I feel. Um, and so it really depended on the participant. OK, but very, 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 very interesting. Measuring privacy or privacy expectations or the value of privacy is very, very complicated. And I, I think there should be more work on that. Um, the value of privacy, it's my, one of my favorite party questions is, right, how much would you pay per month to Google to have email, but no tracking? And the, the, the responses are completely different. Some say, oh, I don't even care. Uh, and some people go to, oh, maybe I could even pay 50 pounds or euros per month. So measuring privacy and all the emotions associated, for example, I think it's uh, work that still needs to be done. I, I, I don't find many work, many people working on that. Yeah, I think a lot of people still have that notion that we're very logical. 
because maybe from more like technical career science, we want it that way. But then there's a lot of work saying that we can be very emotional, we can be very based on trust, we can be very based on context. And then how does that affect how we're trying to build these systems? All right, thank you so much, Inji, Ariane, and, uh, and Gabriele. By the way, I'm working with Gabriele. I see him as, as an author at the end. Um, thank you very much. Very, very interesting, uh, very, very promising. I think this is work that definitely needs uh, follow up and more visibility. Uh, it is one of those problems, communicating consent and people understanding and relating to and trusting. I think that is uh, the, the question here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For the second paper, uh, Niels Weikamp, I hope yes. I'm pronouncing the, the name correctly. Internally, internalization of privacy externalities through negotiation, social costs of third party web analytic tools, and the limits of the legal data protection framework. Very, very interesting paper. Please go ahead, Niels. Okay. One moment. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, my paper was about yeah internalization of privacy externalities through negotiation, social cost of uh, third party web analytic tools and the limits of the legal data protection framework. So first, um, my person like I'm Niels Beckham, I'm a researcher at the Digital Society Institute at the ESMT uh, Berlin. Um, yeah, I'm, my research interest, uh, interests are right now more in the systematization of IT security law and protection of critical, in, uh, critical infrastructure. But um, yeah, I'm still uh, still interested in data protection. Um, yeah, so the research question, uh, research question of my uh, paper was: um, Is the current legal framework within the European Union sufficient uh, sufficient to internalize? externalities within the use or the consumption, uh, the consumption of uh, third-party uh, web analytic tools through negoci uh, negotiation. Um, so yeah, first to get into it, like the background, I think you are all pretty familiar with um, that, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, web analytic tools is one of um, yeah one of the uh, techno web technology that is used on yeah probably most websites on on the internet and um, especially Google Analytics has like more or less like the biggest uh, market share um, and you can also see like in um, this st uh, statistic that um, yeah like the most used uh, web analytic tools are also um, commercial and um, the providers are like a third party and um, I think the, uh, the first one on this list uh, that is not uh, not a third uh, provided by a third party is uh, WordPress uh, jetpack so like most of the most of the websites use actually like a third party um, tool um, which is not operated by themselves and um, yeah you can probably ask, why is that? Probably because the functionality is um, is good, is better than probably like uh, most open source products. And like as a bonus, it's for most of the um, users and websites to use it. It's uh, probably for free. Like um, um, at Google, Anal um, when you use Google Analytics, you can yeah use it for free um, up to like ten million hits per month. So that sh that should be like enough for like most uh, most middle sized websites so like the majority of the users of google analytics um, should be able to use it for free and um yeah that that raises the question like how how does how do google monetize itself how how is it able to like uh, provide such a high quality tool and uh, high quality infrastructure um basically for free like um yeah and i think you are pro um, probably pretty familiar with the yeah with the data economy uh, economy behind it so um, the website owner uses uh, the the analytic tool um it collects user data, a data, personal data from the user, um, collects it in a data pool and gives the website owner um, usage report, um, provides the um, website owner with um, 
uh, reports about the usage of their the website, but um, yeah, they also like uh, merge those data with um, external data from other websites and um, yeah, also use it to monetize it, um, monetize via personal, a personalized advertisement. Um, yeah, so like one requirement for that is that the website owner to agrees to uh, share um, the, the data that is um, that is provided by his website um, with uh, with the provider of the web analytics tool, but um, yeah, in, yeah, practically that is encouraged by um, the fact that if you if you are willing to share share your data and um, to contribute to the huge data pool um, of the of the analytics provider, that you get more quality reports because like. The data is merged with uh, more more other data, and um, so you, um, the website owner, um, actually gains uh, more insight. Like I think, for example, when you use Google Analytics in order to get um, demographic reports of um, information of uh, the visitors of your website, you have to actually, um, yeah, you can only do that if you. Um, uh, if you are willing to share your your data together with Google and allow them to use them for their own advertisement purposes. Um, yeah, and that actually like at first, like, of course, it's it seems like the website owner is getting something. He gets reports, he gets the uh, the tools and the um, um, yeah, he uses the um, the analytic tools and he gains the benefit uh, benefit from it. And it seems like the, the user is paying with his personal data. And um, so the, the benefit lies on the side of the website owner and the user is the one who um, has to bear the cost. And yeah, of course, it first raises some questions of, uh, of fairness, but like from an economic point of view, like from a utilitarian, util, utilitarian um, point of view, you can also argue like, yeah, what's the big deal? Like, if the if the website owner gains more benefit from um, from the use of the um, web analytics tool, then the user um, is affected in his privacy. Like, what's the big deal? So everything, like in a whole welfare economic view, everything should be fine. But like, is it really like um, from like the economic? Um, uh, the, the economic number that is like a uh, um, goal that is that is aimed for is always efficiency. Like you have resource, um, you have a limited number of resources, and you want to gain um, want to gain the most benefit from it. And is it actually the case when the website owner gains the benefit and the user pays for it that um, we get like the most ben benefit out of our resources? Um, so welfare economic one uh, one point one, um, yeah. Like in welfare economics, like the pricing method, um, yeah, the um, the way to, um, yeah, the pricing method always is um, to you have like two two curves. You have the supply curve and the demand curve. Like when the um, uh, and. You, you see like when the cost for a good is like um, it's big like the supply the the marginal cost of the uh, goods um, are high like the, the supply rises and um, if the cost for the for the consumer is um, yeah is, is slow the consumer um, consumes a lot of a um, lot of um, entities of a good and um, if the costs um are higher um the de um, demand are actually like um um lowering and you can see here two curves like uh, two demand curves um one curve like the lower one is like when all costs are considered and um, the higher curve is um the curve um when only the the private when the private um uh, no, no, no sorry it's like other way around like um you can it's the benefit like of the of the consumer of the good if um the marginal benefit and if um um 
all costs of a um, uh, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so um, the, the the higher one is like. Uh, I'm sorry. Like um, I lost my um, point. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So um, it's actually it's like kind of logical. Like when somebody else pays for the consumption of um, of your good, like in this case the um, the um, the user pays for the consumption of the web analytics tool of course the um the website owner is um is in the position to consume more of the services of the web analytics tool because like uh, he doesn't have to consider the cost of it but like um overall in welfare in the welfare economic theory um the consumption of the uh, of the good of the um of the web analytics tool is is higher than in equilibrium like when all costs um should be uh, should be considered and like as a rule of thumb in uh, welfare economics when there's um, um when there's something out of the equilibrium there's like an inefficient market outcome because we don't use our resources to their fullest potential and um uh, it causes inefficiency and um yeah so the externalities in consumption mean that the consumption of the good does not consider the overall cost of the um, consumption but only the private cost so i consume more of a good and um, then it's actually efficient and um this is yeah like not only a question of fairness but also like a question of um yeah efficiency um, we don't use our resources to their full full, uh, full potential and yeah what what do we do um yeah first we have to like ask the question is like the um the use the monetization of the personal data of the website user is that actually um, um a negative externality um uh yeah, the, the question is, is like, does the uh, collection of the personal data impose like a negative effect on the um, on the um, on the data subject? Um, of course, like data itself is like the economic um, characteristics. It's um, not like money or like um, um, other resources, because um, if you like collect the data from the um, from the data subject, like nothing is taken from them like um, you can uh, if you collect their age um, they still know their age and some uh, and other people can still um, still collect information about their age but um, the, the the negative eff effect on the data subject is actually like on the on the notion of privacy and so like if um, personal data is collected this negatively affects the privacy of a of a data subject and this actually then qualifies as a negative externality um, in the consumption of the web analytic tools so in theory in welfare economic theory what can you do about um, um, externalities um, there are different methods like one method for example would be um, to um, to tax the consumption of a, of a good and um, the tax, uh, the, the amount of the tax would be as um, the difference between like the social cost and the private cost. But the scope of this, uh, this paper was to um, examine if um, the um, externality could be internalized um, by, by negotiation. Like there's a, there was a famous, a famous theory uh, from, um, a robot course um, which actually stated that market actors are able to uh, create an efficient market outcome through negotiation without state interference like raising a tax would be state infer interference um, by um, by negotiate uh, negotiate between another like one famous example it's like um, you have a laundry which disposes this um, sewage into a river and uh, then you have a fissure and uh, further down the river. And of course, this is a negative externality um, for, for the fissure because like um, the sea which um, um, spoils the quality of the fish he can, uh, he can fish out of the river. And um, 
the, in theory, there would be the possibility that the fisher and the laundry um, negotiate between each other um, like a pri price, like the fisher, for example, would give the laundry um, a certain amount of money if they don't um, dispose their sewage into the river. Um, and then, for example, yeah, dispose it like um, with, with the company, um, with the, uh, the, the, the disposal company. Um, and in the end of that, there would be um, also an efficient market outcome. Um, but there are certain more requirements for that. And um, the cost theorem was uh, by, uh, adapted by Norm in 1996 for um, online information markets. And those uh, requirements were that there are sufficiently low transaction costs, because um, if the transaction costs are higher than the difference between the social and the private costs, um, it would actually make no sense to engage in the ne negotiation. So the um, transaction costs has, have to be um, sufficiently low. Um, the legal environment um, has to be um, sufficient to have, have to allow to uh, make a transaction possible, like, um, for example, with the, um, if the legal situation was um, the use of personal data would be that, um, would be that, yeah, the collection of personal data is not allowed at all. Um, the, yeah, the data subject wouldn't have any instrument to, he wouldn't have nothing to neg negotiate, negotiate with about and of course this uh, leads to um, the um, probably most important point the ability to create property rights and the rights to include and exclude um, if you don't have the possibility to tell something that he should do something or stop something um, there's no point of negotiate like you have to uh, you have to create rights to uh, make somebody um, yeah, first you have to assign, assign the rights to somebody so that he has something um, he can um, uh, he, he can trade with the other market actor, with the other party. Um, yeah, and um, an industry structure with, permis uh, with permits the transaction to occur. So um, actually, like, if, like, nobody talks to each other and, um, like, you have to have, like, the social... Um, yeah, social and industry circumstances that people talk to each other and are able to negotiate with each other. And um, also most important, um, another very important point is um, symmetry of information about um, the, uh, among the transaction parties. Because like when you negotiate, uh, negotiate with one another, like both parties have to be aware of the actual price and benefit like the um, the thing they are negotiated about um, is like um, for example if you if you negotiate about um, a, a car and a used car and one party knows okay in 10 kilometers there has to be like a major um, there's a major repayment due and the other party don't know it um, yeah one party you, you cannot uh, you cannot negotiate on eye level and uh, this is also um, important to um, negotiate the the right price so coming back to our research question um what do we have to do for, with the further steps like um uh, the scope of the paper was to examine uh, the legal framework current legal framework in the european union and uh, what do we have to do now so um we have to examine if the legal framework can effectively first assign disposal rights, second, prevent inf information asymmetries, and uh, third, um, ensure proficient low transaction costs in order to um, ensure um, a su a successful negotiation. So let's start with assignment of property rights. So what's, what means does the legal framework provide? So yeah, the workshop is named in content. So I'm uh, pretty sure you're all aware that um, they are like, um, yeah, two major um, legal, um, uh, legal instruments to, um, uh, yeah, that ensure that the user is like more or less 
the initial holder of the disposal rights of his personal data because the day, um, processing of the data is more or less uh, prohibited unless um, yeah there are like uh, some exceptions but um, in case of the personal data used for advertisement purposes he actually have to give his consent um, first because um, yeah, for the access to his uh, who is the new device, uh, the access to his uh, end device um, for like placing a cookie um, with uh, or reading of the cookie ID, and um, yeah, the second is um, yeah the actually processing for advertisement purposes um, by the GB, uh, yeah by the GDPR. Um, and also like the controller must demonstrate the um, compliance with the processing and um, uh, has to prove that uh, consent is given uh, is given so um, the disposal rights are actually initially at the um, at the data subject and the controller the owner of the websites has to has to prove that um, um, he the this disposal rights are actually transferred effectively to him and um yeah like there are like uh, further requirements for um for consent that are stated in article uh, 7 gdpr like um to make the transaction like um effective for example the right to uh, withdraw it uh, at any time so but the question is is are those are those means actually effective to effectively um, may, um, effectively assign disposal rights and make the this um, negotiation about disposal rights um, successful. So the design and the implementation of the um, of the constant banner are mostly done by the website owner. So like he is uh, not the is initial hold of the of the disposal rights, but um, he sets like the circumstances and the um, and the um, requirements um, under which circumstances um, the consent is given, and um, the yeah the data subject more or less okay like there are maybe some there are maybe some um, um, options to click on it, but like the the actual contract uh, contract is. Um, designed by um, by the website owner so um, and the ex um, the website owner is also like in the position to um, interpret like the um, the will of the the data subject like he um, he formulates the, the the consent statement and he's in the position to say okay like for me it's like a proper consent uh, given here or or not and um yeah th this actually leads uh, leads to the case like there's like a more or less a race to the bottom um as you're probably all aware of like constant statements uh, five years ago look way worse than they uh, look now and um the website owner is not um it's not in his interest to like give formulate um um um, yeah, like a high quality concept statement that is um, compre comprehensible for the data subject. And um, he's also not uh, interested in uh, giving the data subject like many, um, many options to choose from. And um, so there, there, there more or less is a race to the bottom um, in the quality of those concept statements. And um, like, yeah, as you were pretty, um, all aware of like, mm, the the website owners do um, formulate the content statements in a way that is like slightly above um, the legal requirements, and um, they also test like how which designs, uh, even though they are probably are deceptive, uh, which designs are um, can we do without getting into legal trouble? And there's actually like an um, yeah an enforcement deficit because like the um, our ruling by courts is like pretty pretty slow and um, pretty um, uh, high effort. Um, and actually, like um, the thing, uh, the other thing is 
can the data subject actually comprehend what what he's doing in this negotiation when he's uh, uh, giving his consent and that he's actually like giving away like disposal rights and um because like it's uh, those consent statements are formulated by the by the website owner um it's actually encouraged encouraged by the by the legal framework because like you have to like give consent for more than one one um one subject for you have to give consent for the uh, for the access to your device and you have to um give consent for the processing of the um for advertisement purposes and um when the data subject is not that able to comprehend what is actually negotiate negotiated about um it cannot be effectively yeah um have the power over his uh, disposal uh, rights, which then actually avoids the um, the meaning of disposal rights. Um, yeah, and uh, as I said, like methods to obtain the user consent might be unlawful, and um, but because of uh, the abstract formulation of the law and the slow enforcement speed um, uh, through supervisory authorities, um, misleading methods can lose uh, can be used for for a long time. So the conclusion of that is like the real legal framework generally allows the assignment of disposal rights. Um, however, the practical implementation lacks uh, efficient enforcement. So um, this was all like uh, theoretical, but you can also see it in um, yeah, like uh, empirical, empirical data here from the um, uh, Universität Bochum. Um, they did a survey, like an um, automated survey about the design of consent banner. And uh, here you can see that, um, yeah, the choice, uh, um, they were actually um, in, yeah, most of the um, uh, consent banners, there was like, like in 30% of the consent banner, there was like no um, no option to to give, con um, deny consent overall. and um, in the yeah on the second uh, second level also, and um, this shows that yeah thirty at least thirty percent of the content banners were at that time um, on unlawful, um, which yeah shows that there's an actually and there was like an actually enforcement deficit. Uh, deficit. Um, yeah, information asymmetries like you have to know what you are um, negotiate about. Um, yeah, of course, there are like um, uh, information duties uh, the website owner has to fulfill, like indirectly um, in the way that like the consent have to be given in an informed way, um, um, and directly, um, yeah, by information duty stated in uh, Article Thirteen and uh, Article Fourteen GDPR. And uh, there are also like uh, general legal principles, like um, the consideration or uh, consideration of the um, um, recipient of horizon, um, in a way that you actually have to yeah you have to speak the language of the recipient, and um, yeah so there are legal obli obligations so but are they effective? Um, yeah, so the general complexity of the process um, described might be a bit too too high for the internet user overall to comprehend. Like, you go on a website, you are you are not thinking that if you communicate with a consent banner that you are actually giving um, the consent that um, that all data you um, that is um, that is collected about you is actually going to Google because like you are in a whole different in, in environment um yeah and then i mean like the the first paper was like about the use of um, of comics and uh, icons um i mean those are probably um good ways to make the um yeah make the information easier easier to understand for the web, uh, for the data subject but in a way like the the website owner does not really have like an interest in in actually doing that because um, he he is in, in the position like he has all the information and the data subject is like more more or less in, um, uninformed and um, like naturally like the website owner has no interest in really informing the data subject in a way that's like 
more than legal legally necessary and because like high, the pro, pro, uh, vision of high quality information also there yeah, is uh, it's a huge effort and uh, he has, um, yeah, he has to put effort in it and um, as long as he's like just above like the legal uh, legal obligation um, he has no interest in, um, in put more effort in and um, yeah so the legal requirements are um, for the actual implementation of formulated in a very abstract way, which leaves vast room for interpretation. And I think the legal enforcement there is also um, way, way more slow than uh, with the formulation of content statement in itself. So the legal um, framework generally contains methods to uh, diminish information asymmetries, um, but those only seem to be um, effective to an extent. Like if we go back to the um, to, to the data, you can also see like in the um, in in the um, column in, in the row um, down below that um, yeah, like ninety percent of the um, of the constant state um, constant banners used uh, used the word uh, cookies instead of um, of data, and um, yeah. I think that can be uh, can be seen like a deception in itself, like because like the average internet user might not be aware like what what cookies can be used for, and um, yeah, it's like not every cookie is used for marketing, but um, um, so they are not aware of the technology behind it. Uh, so because like the technology is, uh, is described and not the actual purpose that. Um, that the technology is used for. So um, yeah, the information asymmetries are still um, yeah still not um, probably still there. Um, and the the last point, um, the transaction cost. So like generally, because we like we are on the um, uh, the information. Um, um, in the internet and uh, use uh, technolo uh, technological means. Um, they allow for high automatization, the neg uh, negotiation process, especially on the side of the website owner. Like the website owner has to like put one um, one cookie banner, implement one cookie banner, and um, it can be used like for um, yeah, um, or a high number of uh, negotiation processes. Um, but um, Oh, like uh, here's a mistake. It's not the website. Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, know it's not a mistake. But the the on the side of the website user, he's actually right now in the position that he have to active, have to actively engage in every negotiation, and also he have to like put the effort into diminishes uh, information asymmetries. Like he is, he has to actually read like all the um, all the privacy statements. Um, he's like in the position. I I know nothing about the processing. Um, I have to put in the effort, and um, so actually, like the transaction cost for the data for the data subject are, are, are pretty high. So, in theory, this should be in um, lead to a situation where the initial owner of the disposal right, in this case, the data subject, decides to not engage in the negoti uh, negotiation. But um, yeah, like. This and uh, this theoretical approach could also um, explain why many websites um, use methods like uh, dark patterns and proponent uh, positioning of the constant banner, like to actually force the um, the website user to interact with them um, in a way that yeah the they actually. Um, make the make the transaction cost of not engaging with the negotiation higher than um, than um, the nego uh, negotiation itself, and um, yeah, they artificially create cost and raise the transaction cost, and yeah, in the end of the day, that also should um, yeah, um, that also is is a point that leads to a. To, um, to a not successful negotiation. So in conclusion, um, the so in theory, like the current regulatory uh, framework does uh, not seem to be fitted to internalize the cost of the website, um, you, um, internalize the cost of the website user through means of negotiation. 
The reasons for that are mainly like vaguely and abstract formulated legal requ um, requirements and a slow process of specifying those through um, courts and um, further legal um, uh, yeah, mm, um, uh, further legislative um, measures. Um, ma the market actors that are addressed by the uh, legal requirements actually have like no real intensive uh, incentive to implement those in a high quality way as long as they are slightly above um, um, the law and uh, do not get in, into trouble with that. And um, yeah, information asymmetries uh, um, are there, like because the website, as I said, like the website owner, um, the website users, um, they are unaware of the technical processes behind it, and um, they, yeah, have to put great effort in understanding that, and um, that actually would, um, yeah, um, leaves them uh, leaves them in a uh, in a position where they cannot uh, negotiate uh, negotiate on eye level and make the rational de decision for themselves. Um, yeah, so like very quick outlook to the upcoming e um, e privacy directive, like um, yeah, the current e privacy. Um, um, no e, -pri e privacy regulation. Um, the current uh, draft of the e privacy regulation contains uh, um, regulations propose uh, promote the use of personal information services that could lower the transaction cost on the on the side of the of the website user. Um, maybe enforcement deficits are, are diminished uh, um, could be improved by clearer and less abstract formulation. But like still the problem about the information asymmetries um, remain because the, the user is still in the position to, yeah, he has to inform himself about a, a subject he's uh, like not like while casually surfing the internet, he has to inform himself about the subject he's not that aware of. And like the original sin of the e-privacy directive regarding the use of uh, technology remains like the original sin of the e-privacy directive is more or less that it it um, it regulates the technology and not the purposes behind it and uh, that is like more or less like the reason like in every privacy statement there's a word cookie in it and like in a way like it doesn't matter like which technology is used if it's cookies or uh, something something else and um, um, because of that, um, yeah, but, but like, as I said, like the website owner has no, no incentive to um, formulate it in a different way, um, as long as uh, they, yeah, like the, the law actually um, still, um, yeah, still promotes the, 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 the use of the word cookie in a way. Um, and because that's the case, uh, and this um, this is not changed in the in the new um, e-privacy uh, regulation in the current draft. But um, yeah, let's see uh, how that will turn out. So yeah, that was it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you ever so much. This is fascinating. I think, uh, and again to reiterate consent and privacy uh, is has many 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 faces and there is no way and and there's one one problem that i think starting by your last slide it is one of one of the big problems is to think that this is simply a technical problem it's about cookies it, it's not about cookies at all well it is but uh, no no but look locking the problem like that is completely counterproductive it doesn't work yeah let's stop uh, indeed, there's uh, at least one question in the chat from Paulina. Paulina, would you, would you? Uh, yeah, I wonder whether you have thoughts on that, like in a scenario where users actually could efficiently uh, negotiate over the use mm. of their data, would the data controllers, maybe website uh, publishers, or also ad tech? more scrutinize the, the, the often generalized assumption that um, mm -hmm. personal data is useful for them, that, in, that it increases revenues, because often it's such um, empty words that data is uh, like oil or gold or whatever, mm -hmm. and I think it's not doubted enough. What do you think? I think uh, they, 
there were some papers, I think, also like by by people from the Ruhr um, Universität of Bochum that actually like um, uh, yeah question if like um, the use of personalized data is like efficient like for the companies to use them because like personalized data is more expensive than for example yeah not personalized data when you just um yeah have an ad like in yeah you sell um sell horse riding equipment and of course like then you put in uh, put an end inside in a magazine of horse riding and um or yeah on a website about horse riding and i think they found out that like um, yeah, the um, the yes, I think it's a hard hard way to uh, measure the um, success of um, advertisement. But like the um, conversion rate um, of personalized um, advertisement was higher, but it was like in comparison to the cost um, uh, to the price um, of the um, advertisement, it was um, yeah, like um, the per tr the um, the price per um, per um reaction by by a user was um was higher for personalized advertisement than with non-personalized advertisement um but but i think like it's not a re yeah not as research perspective but like out of practical perspective um i think one one other big um um big plus for the use of um analytic tools in companies is like not that the, the that the advertisement itself is like uh, more successful, but um, like from an in, inner company uh, cycle um, uh, sort of thing, like the the market, marketing um, department now has like the possibility to yeah to to explain themselves, like to create graphs and uh, that goes up and uh, they can show to the uh, the CIO, uh, CIO and um, they have to yeah um uh yeah and and i think this is a thing um you could shouldn't one should not underestimate because like those are the people who decide if um, analytic tools are are used or not and uh yeah those people are probably um yeah using it to um uh yeah explain themselves in their in their own company even if like uh, like for the whole company it's probably not um not efficient. Any other questions with, from the audience? Yeah, I have a question. Hi, Niels. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Very nice. Um, so I was wondering where the analytics, so web services, mm -hmm. can they actually be beneficial for the users as well? Um, that was actually a thing um, that I that is not that good um, carved out in the paper. Um, I wanted to to find something about it, like uh, can can um, uh, can personalized advertisement uh, does it harm the user? Can it be ben beneficial for the um, for the user? Um, and I actually did not find that many. Um, yeah, research on on that. Um, so in, in that way, like um, the thing that uh, I just in the presentation, I uh, just went over very shortly, like, okay, like um, the collection of personalized data um, uh, affects the feeling of privacy for the user in a negative um, way. Um, yeah, th that was like not that good carved out in the, uh, in, in the paper. Um, yeah, but, but like actually on on the other side, you can also uh, if it's just about like personal um, like personal advertisement, um, personalized advertisement. Um, nobody actually needs advertisement to like get the get more. Yeah, like like you have your budget you have to spend um, spend for a month. And um, if there's there's a, you buy the products you think they are best for you, and um, if you are yeah, if somebody advertises another product for you, and you spend your money on that, um, 
but you didn't you knew about that in the first place um then probably in the first place you weren't any you were miss, missing anything and um so like I'm, I'm i'm not sure about that i um it's just like an assumption but like advertising more, more or less uh, only fulfills the um the function of uh, yeah interchanging the products you buy um which provide like an uh um yeah like the same the same benefit for for you um and for for the resources you have but that's actually you um you uh pointed at a at a weak spot sorry for that <laughs> <laughs> no problem so maybe if somebody else uh, um has to uh, say anything about it um i would be very uh, very happy about it because like um, the motivation for the paper originally were like um, before uh, I started the SMT, I um, I worked in, a, in, in an insurance company as a data protection specialist, and the original motivation was like when you talk to the people of the marketing department. Um, of course, they want to implement Google Analytics. You tell them, oh, it's not, uh, yeah, it's like very high effort. You have to put like the, those pop-ups uh, pop up, but yeah, they, they, they don't care. Like as, as long as, um, as it's legally possible there, they want to do it. And it's like always very hard to explain somebody out of marketing department, like what it's, yeah, why privacy actually is is important because like it's it's kind of an abstract um, uh, yeah uh, abstract principle, and um, yeah the motivation was like to find like an another another method to explain why yeah why the use of um, third party data analytics tools um, uh, it's not as neutral or not as beneficial as like uh, marketing. Uh, Thinks uh, thinks it is. Any other question? If not, I do have one. Um, so this idea of bringing or um, about working on this negotiation model, uh, mm -hmm. the best I can. So. Ideas like Brave, where, right, let's stop all the tracking and we pay the user. Mm -hmm. How would this contrast with this, these ideas? Uh, will this effectively bring the user into the, the, the negotiation, negotiation table, I would say? Will this remove these inefficiencies, perhaps create another, uh, certainly create others? How would this change the, the this the situation? Um, yeah, I think um, in that case, the, the, that's like in theory, that's like a working method for internalized uh, the the cost of um, yeah the cost because it's like more or less like an automated text. I would say like uh, the the yeah the hard thing probably would be like um, to to really measure like how how much is the difference uh, like the the how much is the um what's the value of the um, the cost for the the internet user by collecting his his data but like if he if he gets like a compensation for that is it money or is it something else then um yeah then things balance out and um the the website users has to consider those costs and um, probably, yeah, yeah. Then the, 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 that's in theory that's a working method of internal, uh, internalization without negotiation. Right. Can you clarify that? Why without negotiation? Um, or like automate, automated negotiation, like um, mm, yeah, like this this. Mm, I'm, I'm probably depends on the technical um, technical uh, means by um, which that is um, realized. Mm, but um, if it's like a fixed price, there's nothing to negotiate about. Okay, understood. Okay. Yeah. And that 
could be I also find very very interesting the idea that uh, never thought about that that a, a privacy notice is indeed under control of the data controller so there is indeed an information asymmetry there because uh, it, it sounds very very obvious I never have I have never thought about this uh, this way indeed you're selling a used car and indeed the description of the car <laughs> is the seller's uh, own mm -hmm. description and not quite so there's a, a trust element there beyond uh, say understandability or friendliness yeah indeed indeed <laughs> very 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 good point that'll be from my side any other questions i'll give a couple of minutes more thank you so much niels thank you i should say this is uh, again it's um it's why this whole con idea of consent is so fascinating to me at least i think it's uh, there's so many angles it's so complicated it looks so simple but now it's very very it's an evil thing so and nobody has answers nothing really works um indeed thank you very much Neil. thank thank you very much everybody we are going to break for lunch and we will be back if my records are correct at 2 p.m 2 p.m ct of course um for another paper and the keynote so Thank you. Welcome back, or welcome if it's the first time you joined the, the consent workshop. Um, in the afternoon, we've got a paper um, from Lawrence de Bakker. I hope I'm reading it correctly. A policy oriented architecture for enforcing consent in solids. And then um, we'll go straight into the, the keynote by Robin Burgeon. I'll make introductions uh, by then. So, um, Lawrence, if you may. Okay, great. Uh, I'll quickly share my screen here. And that was pronounced perfectly, uh, by the way. So, you should be able to see my screen now. I think I'm going to move this up to the top. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Consent 2022 uh, paper presentation on a policy oriented architecture for enforcing consent in SOLID. My name is Lawrence de Wackerge. I am a researcher uh, working uh, with Ghent University on personal data vaults uh, following the solid specification and more specifically on how we can implement and enforce higher level concepts from a business legal and end user point of view uh, on top of solid uh, so concepts like uh, data governance and compliance with data processing and data protection regulations focus of today's paper uh, and I'll, what I will be, uh, will be presenting is uh, the modeling obtaining and enforcing of consent uh, in applications and services built on top of uh, SOLID. We proposed a reference architecture for building this out uh, in applications that build on top of SOLID personal data vaults. The presentation itself is structured in uh, five parts. I'll start with a brief introduction to SOLID because um, some of you might not yet be familiar with the project. Um, then zooming in on authorization in SOLID, the fundamental building block that is used in uh, implementing data sharing patterns right now when developing SOLID applications, uh, what it allows for and what its shortcomings and limitations are. Uh, then we'll zoom into the problem statement that our paper uh, aimed to tackle uh, and that my broader research line uh, is trying to solve um, before jumping into the architecture that we're actually proposing um, for enforcing uh, data protection and more specifically the legal ground of uh, consent uh, in SOLID, uh, followed by a discussion and the conclusions so far of this uh, research. And of course, room for your audience questions. So let's start off with an introduction to the SOLID project. The SOLID project uh, was started uh, with the aim of restoring end users uh, control over their data. It's the brainchild of the web's inventor, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, and it relates quite closely to the three challenges for the web uh, Sir Tim formulated back in 2017. Uh, three challenges, namely uh, the influence of political advertising on our behavior, uh, the spread of misinformation and fake news across the web, and then finally uh, the challenge of a loss of control over our personal data on the web and how online services and applications uh, use or abuse um, this. The SOLID project itself has as a goal to develop a specification for decentralized personal data storage servers. They're also referred to as pods, which you will hear me say throughout the rest of this presentation. 
At its core, Solid is a new way of building applications and services on the web by separating apps and services from the data that they use. Whereas typical and traditional service providers and applications uh, store their data inseparably from the app and service that they provide, leading to duplicated efforts, outdated and incomplete information that's spread out across the web and that's um, subject to different legal agreements, to different consent agreements that you may have entered into without even properly considering uh, the consequences, Solid proposes a new model for data governance where uh, user choice is returned to the web, where all your data is stored uh, under your control in your own personal uh, Solid pod. And Solid realizes this by building upon existing web uh, standards. Solid doesn't aim to invent a new uh, kind of web, but it tries to build on existing standards like HTTP, like OpenID Connect, and extend them into this new decentralized vision of a fairer web. The Solid specification itself consists mainly of three parts. Uh, the linked data platform specification on which it builds governs read and write access, atomic access to resources, data stored in your Solid pod with specific affordances for handling linked data. Um, secondly, we have the Web ID and Solid Open ID Connect specification, which handles identification and authentication in Solid in a decentralized manner. A Web ID is a unique identifier for uh, an agent, a user, or a service in the Solid ecosystem. Uh, it's nothing more than a URI that links you to the identity providers that you trust, which follow this uh, Solid Open ID Connect specification. This, of course, is an important building block in identifying the agents that you're later on authorizing access to your data for. And then finally, we have the Web Access Control specification, which is also the subject of the research in our paper. Uh, the Web Access Control specification allows uh, users to define access control policies over the resources that's, that are stored in their pods. It's based on the principle of atomic access control lists, uh, which are expressed as linked data. So let's zoom into uh, web access control a little bit more to highlight how it is currently applied uh, by application developers, what its affordances are, but also what its restrictions and limitations are. Web access control uses the concept of a web ID. So this URI that links you to your trusted identity providers and unambiguously identifies you in this solid ecosystem to authorize access to resources. It allows for access control rules to be defined at web scale. And in term, it works reasonably well uh, in the context of social interactions. Consider the way we are using email addresses to uh, send things to our colleagues, to our family, to our friends, uh, share information on services like Google Drive or Dropbox. Um, but as soon as the agents we are sharing access with um, become less clearly defined, it becomes a lot harder to have this web ID uh, be a certainty of, a, of some agent. Um, Secondly, authorization in web access control is defined on uh, singular resources or folders, containers of resources, which is quite similar to how sharing features in online services like Google Drive work. Um, it also comes with the implication that permissions on these shared folders um, are inherited, which may not align as closely with user expectations, especially as resource hierarchies become less clearly defined. So the limitations in uh, authorization in Solid are threefold. Firstly, we have the fact that IRIs are used to identify uh, both the resources that we are sharing, so the containers or the files, as well as these authorized parties, uh, where resource naming strategies, so the way that files and containers in your Solid pod are defined, are mostly up to developers' choice and thus become quite arbitrary. Um, which leads to poor interpretability of uh, data sharing that is occurring through these web access control rules. And secondly, the fact that we are using URIs to identify the agents with whom we are sharing information um, opens up uh, the risk of uh, phishing, which has become a very prevalent attack in um, modern businesses and, and modern applications. So one has to be sure of the data that they are sharing on the one hand, and on the other hand, with whom they are sharing it, um, in terms of this web ID, this identifier. Um, secondly, we have the inheritance mechanism, which can be uh, counterintuitive for an end user who is unaware of this resource organization and resource naming strategy, as it's mostly up to developers' choice up until now. Um, this inheritance mechanism uh, has the potential of leading to unintended information disclosures, as uh, an end user may not be aware of the fact that this inheritance principle applies to the data that they are sharing. And then finally, because of the fact that 
permissions are granted on an ad hoc basis through this web access control specification, we have an increased complexity for an end user. Uh, it's not as easy to say, I want to share all of my medical records with my healthcare professional. Um, we have to do this on a resource or a folder basis, which leads to uh, an overburdening. And we've seen in the past with the cookie banner effect, uh, with the effect of checkbox based consent on the web, that this increase in complexity leads to a desensitization as well. So what does a web access control rule typically look like in solid? Um, well, I'm highlighting the important parts here, but uh, this web access control rule, for example, could govern uh, access, read and write uh, to your medical records for uh, your doctor. Um, suppose uh, we are identifying our doctor using this um, fictional um, web ID. Uh, how, are, how is one sure of the fact that this actually belongs to the healthcare professional that's in front of them? Um, moreover, uh, we are identifying the medical records as, a, as an IRI in this web access control rule as well. How are we certain that this actually is a container of medical records? For example, uh, an arbitrarily different implementation choice on the end of the developer could have led to a totally different name, a random one or patient records or something uh, very similar, but not the same, um, which may lead to user confusion, which may lead to uh, interpretability that worsens. So the problem statement that we aimed to solve in this research um, is threefold. Firstly, web access control as an access control policy language. It's suitable for simple use cases, but it lacks the expressivity and the interpretability in data processing applications. It's hard to extend upon, but it's suitable for these simple cases and it provides all of the necessary affordances at an atomic level we need to implement our, our applications and our services. Secondly, there is limited research into implementation of concrete data sharing patterns in SOLID with the required legal and technical uh, safeguards. And then finally, we identified prior research on applying more expressive policy languages in SOLID, data usage uh, policy languages and access control policy languages, proposals uh, based on uh, ODRL, on special. Um, but there we notice that further work is needed to actually integrate these languages in the concrete use case within uh, an actual implementation of the solid server. So the research objectives for, the, for this paper um, were the following. Firstly, we wanted to identify the shortcomings of solid's existing access control mechanism, and more specifically, how it is used by, the, by developers, what its limitations are, what its affordances are. And secondly, we wanted to put forward a reference architecture for complex data processing applications uh, based on uh, consent in SOLID by reconciling end user and re legal requirements through abstractions that are built on top of SOLID's existing authorization model. And finally, and this is in the broader research line, we also uh, looked at implementing this architecture, which is still an ongoing effort. So related work uh, to uh, the paper that we are presenting here today uh, is the data privacy vocabulary, which is a linked data vocabulary for modeling information uh, related to the processing of personal data. It's based on the requirements set forth by uh, different data protection regulations uh, at a more uh, global level, and then has specific extensions uh, at um, the, the individual legislation uh, level, like uh, an extension for GDPR. The Open Digital Rights language uh, is a language for expressing policies using the ONTIC concepts, uh, policies that govern uh, resources uh, through, for example, permissions, prohibitions, and obligations. An ODRL profile has been proposed as an extension to SOLID's access control mechanism, but thus at this lower web access control um, level rather than um, building this up at a, at a higher level uh, as we are proposing in this paper. And then finally, we have the special policy language, which was um, created in the context of the special research project with the goal of reconciling uh, big data applications with regulatory requirements under data protection regulations. Uh, from that project, a proposal was also made on how to uh, introduce solid pods into the architecture of the special project. In terms of the concrete technical architecture we are proposing in our paper, um, Two uh, specification efforts were of significant importance. Uh, the work uh, by Solid Data Interoperability Panel, of which I'm a member as well, uh, which has the goal of uh, enabling safe and effective interoperability uh, on resources stored in a solid pod for multiple applications and services at the same time. Um, they handle this by tackling two important challenges. Firstly, this arbitrariness of resource organization they aim to solve by introducing the abstraction of shape trees, which define more abstract resource hierarchies in your pods, like the medical records, which could contain prescriptions, medical imaging, et cetera. 
And secondly, by standardizing the mechanics of requesting and granting access in the application interoperability draft specification. In order to realize this vision, the data interoperability panel uh, proposes the concept of a trusted authorization agent, which is tasked with managing this access requesting and access granting process for application developers. And then finally, we have the linked data integrity specification, which allows for authentication and data integrity capabilities in linked data resources, and which is important in order to uh, establish trust and uh, establish integrity and provenance between the different components in our uh, proposed architecture. So the architecture itself splits up the problem of implementing consent and other legal bases for data uh, processing into two realms. Uh, an end user realm that is governed by a so-called access management app, which could be a consent management app, a data sharing preferences app, or even a, a contract management app, um, if we want to broaden up the scope of the legal bases that are supported. This access management app um, processes requests in terms of higher level abstractions for classifying data, uh, like, the data uh, like the personal data categories as they are specified under um, data protection regulations, such as GDPR. Um, and then by validating data processing requests in terms of these higher level abstractions, which are coming from uh, a data controller against preferences by the end user and against the legal requirements that are applicable under the jurisdiction. Finally, the decision of this access management app is stored in the data subjects solid pod. Secondly, the technical realm is governed by uh, an authorization agent. Uh, this authorization agent um, is actually um, a uh, part thus of the uh, data interoperability uh, panels work and the application interoperability spec it is governed um, by that specification or the draft specification it thinks of resource organization in terms of shape trees rather than these higher level abstractions and it handles the concrete technical access needs of specific agents that are requesting the processing of data based on prior approval through these access management apps the architectural proposal um, in a more concrete sense, this is an access management app that is delivering processing grants by matching the request coming in from a data controller against preferences by the data subject, against legal requirements that are applicable and by um, uh, gathering the, the explicit consent of the data subject. Central to the architecture is still the uh, data subject solid server, which conforms almost entirely to the existing solid specification in terms of authorization and access control. We are building abstractions on top of solid rather than trying to reinvent everything. Uh, personal data in the solid pod is organized using these shape trees as are defined under uh, the data interoperability panels work and processing grants uh, are stored there, which are made by the access management app and uh, completed with a data integrity signature, and data integrity proof. The authorization agent uh, finally receives these uh, concrete access needs in terms of shape trees from a data processor, an application that is tasked um, by the data controller that has obtained a grant. Um, these access needs are in terms of shape trees, the actual lower level um, resource hierarchies that the application is requesting access to, which are matched against these processing grants that are provided by the access management app. So our architecture aims to avoid the introduction of legal or business concepts in lower level authorization mechanisms, contrary to what prior proposals and prior research has tried to do. We aim to build layered abstractions on top of the web access control specification and in turn reduce assumptions on the features that are supported by the pod. The individual solid pod doesn't need to support a complete ODRL profile or its evaluation, but rather still support this basic access control policy language that is defined by the spec. We are increasing uh, efficiency as well by taking this evaluation of policies into an out of band negotiation step. So no additional policy evaluation happens during individual requests after these access needs have been converted into a grant by the authorization agent. However, challenges do still exist if you want to implement this architecture. For example, because of the fact that we are doing this translation into lower level atomic access control lists, it makes exposed compliance checking based on these higher level policies that were defined by an end user much harder because we lose this level of detail. Secondly, uh, the defining of a suitable policy language that provides us with affordances of both uh, this higher level description of data processing in terms of abstract uh, personal data categories with the preferences of an end user and then linking that to the lower level uh, shape trees um, and, and resource definitions that are known to the authorization agent is an important capability that has to be provided by a policy language 
um, which we haven't been able to identify as for now yet. In conclusion, the architecture uh, that we present today uh, serves as a foundation for research into access control and data usage policies. It's built on top of the existing solid specification through abstractions, and it's based on some of the more recent uh, work that has come from uh, the solid community and its proposals. But further work is still needed from a technical perspective in order to identify and implement uh, a proper policy language that can serve both this end user realm and this technical realm in terms of its capabilities. Uh, the legal requirements and the legal implementations of these data sharing preferences and how they um, and SOLID's novel model for data governance uh, implicate, for example, data protection regulations still has to be considered. And then finally, we have the concern of how user experience is impacted and what this novel model for data governance means for end users and how they handle consent. And on that note, uh, I want to end this presentation with a, a quote that I've always found very uh, inspiring. It was for a couple of years on the side of our university hall building. Um, and I think it highlights quite well the fact that SOLID is one of these small things that may make our web safer, better, that may make consent uh, a true ground for data processing, but it won't be the only thing that solves this very big and very important problem once and for all. And on that note, um, I conclude my presentation um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed, if anybody's expecting a major breakthrough that will solve everything, no, no, no. That, no it's those little small things, even though I think solid is disruptive or um, it is a new way of potential new way of doing things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Carlos. Okay. Uh, I, I know that I've asked this a lot and it's a never ending debate, but uh, both Lauren and Ruben are here as well. Um, so in solid, it, things kind of work very technically, but then when you move across different places, they all have different laws and different concepts and different terms and different ways of how the user interacts with the service. Um, how do you foresee your idea of an architecture, your vision to kind of either change or generalize these changes? Like the web is supposed to be agnostic. So it, yeah. it can solid be agnostic. Yeah, this is something we, we considered in drafting out this architecture as well. One of the important challenges indeed is different legislation, uh, different um, um, regulations exist in, in different places. And you can't expect a, a technical component like an authorization mechanism to understand each of these local regulations and how they impact data sharing. Uh, it, it's one of the drivers for the introduction of a concept like an access management app, which could take these local preferences and these, these local applicable legal realities into account while having this lower level authorization agent just have a trust relationship with these different entities and trust the fact that they know their local regulations and they know how to implement them. Um, to jump back to the architecture, the idea is that an end user could be interacting with multiple access management apps and the authorization agent would have a trust relationship with this access management app to know that it has correctly applied these, these local regulations and its specifics and checked against um, what they have in terms of in, uh, implication on data sharing and in terms of data processing. If that's clear and answers your question. Yeah, I think that's that's... That's as good as any answer that I've heard yet. So, like, thanks. And it will be interesting to see how this works in practice. So, I look forward to to knowing more about this. Thanks, Patricia. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, I would like to know more about how uh, is made the preference or legal requirements and also about the uh, compliance checking because that's that's very hard yeah i agree so this is so what we are proposing here today is uh, an, an architecture where we provide the building blocks and provide the interface points for these different very hard problems of course like uh, compliance checking like um, data sharing preferences and data sharing policies that you are defining as an end user I've personally come across the fact that it's very hard to find uh, a solution that to find policy languages and policy evaluation that is 
practical and usable in this context. And so my focus has mostly been on providing the interfaces, providing the extension points for plugging in these technologies and building upon this architecture in future research rather than already finding a solution uh, for these problems. I've seen promise in the use of ODRL. I've seen promise in the special policy language, but each of these languages seem to have their own challenges. While the special policy language provides a lot of affordances in terms of uh, the evaluation of um, compliance to, to policies that are specified by an end user and the requests that are coming in from a data controller, um, they lack, for example, the ONTIC concepts that are common in ODRL, but ODRL then lacks in the area of compliance checking, which is mostly defined right now on an ad hoc basis specific to the profile. So there are challenges which each of the two main policy languages that we've evaluated in the context of this proposal. Um, and I haven't yet found a perfect solution, um, which I don't think even exists right now, which is the motivation for providing this architecture and implementing it as a test bed for future research and for plugging in um, proposed languages and proposed policy uh, enforcement. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Then I'll seek a clarification myself. Um, I, I, I think the word policy is sometimes used, or perhaps I didn't get it, used in different ways. One thing is the, a policy for access control. The other is the policy as in the consent of, in the, in the sense of um, uh, previously notice kind of thing. Could you clarify yeah, I... that they are very different? And sometimes I was, it got me confused, even though the word uh, privacy policy it should be eradicated from from the earth because there's no policy well, in the us maybe uh, so could you just quickly clarify where each one falls into yeah definitely so i i agree indeed the the word policy is perhaps an overloaded term i'm i'm guilty of that myself as well um the goal primarily is that um policies in in terms of of an actual policy that is defined um, like it is in, in ODRL, so permission, a prohibition, or an obligation, that squarely falls in the realm of the access management app, where an end user specifies data sharing preferences, where a data controller specifies what actions they want to perform, and where uh, uh, compliance checking occurs. So where we're actually using a policy as a way of defining actions that can happen on a piece of data or that are explicitly prohibited. In the technical realm, um, we, we also use uh, the term policy, but perhaps overloaded, I would agree. Um, an authorization agent aims to perform a, a matching step against this grant that has previously occurred. And of course, in order to do this translation from this higher level definition in terms of personal data categories into something that is technically enforceable at the level of an authorization mechanism, also requires a form of translation which was overloaded in the form of a term policy, but perhaps policy isn't even the best naming. I haven't found a proper word for it just yet, um, but I agree on your point. Um, Thank you very much indeed, indeed. I'm now a bit more reassured. Indeed, indeed. I think those, those translations, those mappings, and uh, yeah, indeed are very, very difficult. And as you go down technically, it's simple. It's at the end of the day, it's just uh, enforcing rules. But as you go up and you get closer to the user, it gets very, very, very difficult indeed. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you so much. Thank you for having uh, me. We now move to Robin, Robin Burgeon, our um, keynote. A very, very interesting and intriguing. Well, not intriguing. Uh, I definitely look forward to hear. Um, Robin is indeed, indeed. Good afternoon, good morning for you, I believe. Good morning, yes, good afternoon, everyone. So the keynote is by Robin Burgeon, and rather than reading the text, uh, because that will be the talk, I will just say, um, I'll share this thought. Yesterday, the organizers of the workshop were having a chat, preparing things, and uh, there was this very, very interesting concept that I've never heard of in data protection privacy, which is, Self-determination. Apparently, this is a concept well established in German, or at least German-speaking countries, I would imagine. But it was the first time I, I, I heard this. I think it's probably captures much of the problem of, of uh, 
that we're talking about. The, the, the keynote of Robin titled Consent of the Government, of, of, the, of the Governed. And at some point, there's this also interesting concept uh, saying that uh, consent these days, it's mostly a procedural ghost. So it's, and, and I, I hope Robin agrees with me, it became by large meaningless. It's just compliance for compliance. It's just, I don't know, doing what everybody is doing. And uh, whoever has the power and the interest and the motivation is abusing the system. So it's all very, 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 very messy uh, landscape we've got. Robin Burgeon is a core web person, well known as the editor of the HTML5 specification, an experienced participant within W3C, co-author of Global Privacy Control Specification, the GPC, um, and current VP for Data Governance at the New York Times. Robin was also a panelist at the first edition of the Consent Workshop. Will also be uh, after this afternoon. Thank you very much. Welcome. The mic to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone. And <clears throat> just to make sure that everything is smooth, I, I pre-recorded the, the keynote, but I'm here for questions uh, in the chat and, and right afterwards. Let me know if it doesn't work. It is Hi, right. my name is Robin Burgeon, and I am VP of Data Governance at The New York Times. I am also closely involved in the, uh, the TAG, the W3C's technical architecture group, um, work on privacy principles that are intended to guide um, a definition and an operation of privacy um, for the entire web. It's a great pleasure to be here today at the consent workshop, so let's jump right in. Consent is a rich and complex topic with a history that goes back over a century, especially for medical cases. But as of four or five years ago, it became particularly salient in, um, in human computer interaction systems, uh, thanks to the GDPR that um, led to the adoption of consent across a huge swath of the, uh, of the web. Um, and and created uh, any number of issues that I'm sure you are all very much familiar with. And with that in mind, the question that brings us all together today, the question that has been animating conversations around consent on the internet for the past few years is what the actual fuck happened with this train wreck that we have here? We have all used computers. We are all familiar with bad user interfaces. We've we've seen the GDPR consent dialogues, and and we, we've gotten used to that to them. But but seriously, what what is this thing? What is this this catastrophic um, accumulation of uh, of mistakes? Um, just like the list of purposes is insanely long, but it keeps getting worse the closer you look. Now, what we have here is for each purpose two legal bases to choose from um, both of which are in an indeterminate state for some reason i don't know if this is supposed to represent maybe some kind of qubit system entangled qubits where um, you observe one and you might find something out about the other i don't know what happens if you uh, say no to consent and yes to legitimate interest i I don't know why there are only two. Why not pick all six? Why not have you know the vital interests of the data subjects and and a contract um, as as uh, other options? I mean, if people are picking and choosing the own legal bases they want, um, you might as well give them um, a broad a broad option and a, a, a wide set of choices. But again, it keeps getting better. I mean, let us take a moment to enjoy the absolute user interface HCI genius of this struggle, this trinary toggle. Is it yes? Is it no? Who knows? It's somewhere in the middle. It's neither yes nor no. And you can pick and maybe then you can't return to the center. But um, this is uh, you know, obviously choice at its best. It is respecting the autonomy of, of the data subject. But what's absolutely gorgeous here is the way in which the user interface works with the legal genius, this 
you know, this 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 person who who thought, hey, what if I were MTV pimp my website with my consent banners um, and figured out that, hey, you you like legal basis. So I put the legal basis on legal basis so you can legal basis while you're legal basising. I mean, the lawyer behind this and the UX uh, uh, specialist who worked together are a team to be really reckoned with. And of course, you know better, much better than to click on this part of the user interface that I've just demonstrated. Fun fact, because we can't be serious about all the things all the time. When I initially started working on uh, the paper that goes with this presentation, I instinctively uh, called that trinary toggle a monstrosity a troggle. And in my mind, I was using a term of art, something that you know any HCI uh, expert out there might recognize as being the troggle. Um, it turns out that upon uh, further investigation, um, that term did not exist, at least not in this space, um, even though it has been used, as you can see, in other contexts. So I now fear that um, uh, one of the, the primary contributions I've made to posterity might be naming uh, that atrocious um, uh, UX design pattern. So, but okay, things are bad, or at the very least, some people are doing some bad things. But let's take a few th steps back, right? Let's let's try to figure out what it is we were collectively trying to achieve with this with this system in the first place, and why is it that it's not working out as well as uh, a lot of us would have liked? Now, obviously, this is not a book length presentation and so I'm going to give a very very abridged introduction uh, to to the, the the background on the topic but hopefully that's enough background that we can all be uh, on the same page um, and just to be clear I'm, 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 I'm citing Belmont here uh, but it's just an example of a potential source an influential one no doubt uh, but there were there were numerous others in other languages and from from other countries uh, as well but so basically the core idea that we're working with um, that can be grounded in part, you know, I mean, that has been grounded in medical ethics or in uh, human subjects research is that we want to, um, you know, we want to, to, to support respect for persons um, and primarily in, in, in what concerns us here, we want to support autonomy, autonomy of the, uh, of the data subject. The way this has been operationalized um, in, uh, in, in human subjects research, notably, is through informed consent. Um, but it's important to understand that the principle itself is not informed consent. People often take that shortcut and jump straight to, to that conclusion. The principle is autonomy and, and respect for, 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 for persons. Um, and so the idea really is how do we operationalize that in the best way? It has worked with informed consent in other contexts, but the question is, has, will it work and does it work here as well? And it turns out that there are very good reasons to doubt that it is working in this specific context, in this deployment. Uh, you know how we all enjoy complaining about how technologists like to take a solution that has been developed in, in one area and just sort of like lift it, cut and paste it in another area and sort of act very puzzled when it doesn't work um, uh, because it has been transplanted without its entire infrastructure, conceptual infrastructure, institutional infrastructure, everything that makes it tick. Um, well, what we're dealing with here is a very similar problem. Basically, the idea of, of informed consent has been taken um, from other contexts in which it works really well, but applied here um, without, without the institutional support that, that it requires. And so, for instance, there is no IRB that will ensure that every single potential processing is ethical before it has even been consented to. And so this in, in a commercial HCI context mean, means that you will have unethical processing that people need to consent to that already makes the problem much harder than in human subjects research, for instance. Um, we're also dealing um, with the fact that we cannot assume that in commercial contexts, um, the, the outcome of the operation will be beneficial 
uh, to the data subject or to humankind, uh, which is a balancing test that can and does apply in, in research because that's what that's what research is done. That, that's why research is done. And, and finally, people have to consent or at least are confronted with, with consent dialogues in situations where they need to get something done. They need to access these services. Um, and that means they are not volunteers in the way that, that human subjects might be volunteers, are often are volunteers um, in, in, in research context. So all of this introduces friction and makes it difficult to simply translate um, notions of informed consent over into, into more commercial contexts. New day, new shirt. So uh, just because consent wants, uh, you know, the underlying infrastructure um, that has made informed consent work in other contexts, um, once it's removed, consent is in trouble. But that doesn't mean that we can't make it work. And in fact, we need to figure out how to make it work for the cases in which it, it is useful. And so in this, I'm drawing and stealing quite liberally from, from the work of, of Richardson and, and Hartzog on uh, pathologies of digital consent. And really the idea here is not to look at the legal requirements that exist uh, because sometimes they'll be good and sometimes they'll be terrible. Here, really, the idea is to uh, is to look at humans as you know uh, regular people like us um, with bounded rationality who cannot make perfect decisions under any circumstance, and therefore, how to figure how can we figure out to um, you know ways in which we can make uh, consent work for people in real world scenarios deployed in a in a commercial um, HCI con context, and so. The, the, the rules are pretty, are, are, are pretty uh, straightforward. First, it, it needs to be rare. Uh, if you ask people to consent all the time, you're really going to be uh, taxing uh, their ability to make informed decisions. So it's important that that, that consent be infrequent. Um, the harms from consenting, the potential downside, must be extremely vivid. This, this helps compensate for the fact that there is no IRB that will filter out unethical um, um, you know the, the, the data processing, and so we really need to make to make it clear that that when people consent, they know what they they're getting into. Um, and finally, uh, people must be incentivized to choose well. We're all lazy, um, and uh, if we don't have a good incentive to make the right decision, if we you know if we feel like it doesn't matter, uh, like we're helpless and we've lost control anyway, um, then we're not going to make decisions that actually align with our best interests and with our values and with how we would choose our data to be to be processed. Um, you know, if we if we had. Uh, an infinite amount of, of, uh, of rational resources and, and, and time to pick. So these are really the, the, the basic things that make consent tick. Now, I think a good idea is to look at a case in which consent works, um, even um, in cases when um, uh, legal requirements such as from e-privacy or, 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 or the GDPR can get in the way. Um, of, of consent working well in, in some cases. Here we have a case where it works perfectly well. And so, you know, it's this good old, you know, click here um, to sign up to our newsletter with the checkbox being off by default. And this is something that's typically infrequent. Uh, you only see it uh, when you when you create a new account, for instance. Um, of course, there are sites that will that will create pop ups. Uh, for precisely this kind of purpose, um, those sites do not meet uh, requirements for, for 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 good good consent, uh, human friendly consent. Um, the harms of spam are pretty vivid. Everyone has gets spam. Everyone knows uh, what having a crowded mailbox looks like, um, and they're they're good incentives to to choose well. You know, people can make up their mind as to whether they're interested in receiving the newsletter or not. Um, it's off by default, which which really helps in case you're in a hurry, you won't get it. Um, it's always fixable in the future uh, and you know it. Uh, so people are aware of the situation um, and they, they are mentally equipped uh, to deal with it um, pretty easily. So this is a case in which consent is, is, is valid from a human perspective and um, that works uh, quite well. Of course, it still means that some of us will, will sign up to too many newsletters because they get excited about this new site they discovered. Um, but again, this is something that, that can easily be fixed um, at a later time. So 
that was for a successful case. Now let's look at some failures. And obviously, um, uh, you know, GDPR, e-privacy, uh, consent banners are, are, are probably everyone's most hated feature in, uh, in, 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 in privacy law. And, and they're quite obviously one of the biggest failures of, 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 of European regulation um, when it comes to data, data protection, um, aside from, from you know, um, Ireland. And so um, one of the key failures uh, here, and that, that is not easily fixable with DPI um, uh, guidance and, and requirements, as, as you know, uh, DPAs keep, keep um, adding um, uh, you know, tighter, tighter definitions of what, of what valid consent is down to you know, the, 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 what the buttons need to look like and, 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 and that kind of stuff. And no matter, no matter how tight you make it, um, you cannot deal with the fact that every single website and app out there is going to have the same requirements and therefore that people who navigate the broad um, uh, web will, will, will encounter these um, very frequently, far more frequently than, than they can, than they can uh, usefully deal with um, with, with, with uh, bounded rationality. So obviously, no matter, no matter what kind of consent <coughs> um, dialogue you, you, you create, it will fail on this test. Um, so that, that is already a, a, a problem uh, for, for that approach. A second failure mode of, of banners is that they completely fail at conveying what harms might be entailed. Uh, essentially, uh, above a certain threshold, which is arguably quite low, um, any kind of processing requires consent and all of that consent looks pretty much the same. So whether you are carrying out some uh, first party analytics uh, that goes a little bit beyond um, what, what DPA guidance uh, suggests is, is acceptable under, under legitimate interest, or whether you are broadcasting um, sensitive information to hundreds of third parties um, that are all of them data controllers and all of them recognize people across their, you know, a broad, um, a, a broad section of, of their online behavior. These two things will, will, will be presented to people in essentially the same way, which completely destroys any, any idea, any perception, uh, any intuitive understanding of the difference um, in, 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 in threats and, and, and harms. And so uh, basically this idea of using the, reusing the same UI uh, for everything is also something that is, that is hard to create um, uh, rules for and, and, and therefore something that that will um, undermine uh, the, this kind of approach to consent uh, fairly, you know, ra rather often. And finally, uh, the the banners fail on 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 the uh, the incentives test as well, uh, because typically banners, you know, are completely in the way. They completely blocking or at least partially blocking um, the experience often they're used as modal dialogues or they take up a significant chunk of real estate as 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 we can see with this one here um, the the really the incentive for people is to get them out of the way um, as fast as possible and you know make sure that that they 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 don't they don't interrupt the the experience and so people's incentives are to go through them as fast as possible and even if you if if you enforce that say both by Buttons, the accept and reject um, must be must be of the same color, the same size, um, whatever whatever the latest um, guidance and, and requirements are. Even with that, there will always be a, a preference in terms of focus, which one is on on the right, um, which one uh, appears closest to something else. There's always a way uh, in terms of UI to give one preference over the other. Uh, you might decrease the consent rate um, with stricter guidelines, but you'll never get it to the level at which we can say that people are giving any kind of usefully informed consent and making real um, proper decisions when when they're dealing with something that they just want to get rid of as fast as possible. Now, there is nothing in e-privacy or in the GDPR that says that you must use a banner. So there's a real sense in which it might not be 
um, the regulations fault if we see these, these, these terrible implementations. But at the same time, when regulating a system at this kind of scale, it's very important to think um, adversarially, to, to build it in such a way that the people who want to work around it, who want to break it, uh, won't be able to do so. And that is where consent becomes particularly problematic. Uh, uh, you know, I often hear people uh, say things like, oh, consent is wonderful. It's only that marketers or ad tech have broken it. Um, but if it's breakable, uh, it's not a very good defense. It's not a very good data protection mechanism. It's a bit like saying, oh, I encrypted everything with uh, ROT13, which is, um, you know, I mean, look it up. It's not a great encryption scheme, but those, those evil people uh, broke my encryption scheme. Um, and so uh, I've looked at a few issues with, 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 with banners, but the issues keep going. And, and it, it's hard to see how to fix all of them at the kind of scale that we're dealing with. One suggested fix for um, issues that have been seen with, with, with consent banners um, that uh, the DPB gives some, some, some uh, credibility to uh, and that I've often seen lawyers get quite excited about is layered consent. Um, layered consent is, is essentially the idea that um, if you have too much information uh, in order to, to, to show the data subject in order to get uh, informed consent, then you should solve that by showing them less information and uh, requiring of them that they dig uh, more deeply into the, into the user interface in order to figure out what they're, what they're consenting to. Perhaps one of the um, most difficult part of getting consent right is that it, it, architecturally it, 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 it relies on the party um, that has the greatest incentive to present its work in, in, the, in, in the nicest light to tell the truth and, and, and to provide people with the means to, 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 to decide. That, that doesn't work because you can force people to say some things, but you can't always force them to present things in, in, in the way that is the most relevant to, to the data subject. And that can be seen quite clearly with the silent part in the statement, right? The, the initial half, the first half of the sentence uh, could credibly exhaust the topic. And it's, it's, it's quite typical of the, the, the kind of uh, description of data processing that, that one might see. But without telling people what is being optimized for and how exactly, um, then the, you, you're not exactly telling um, P, data subjects uh, what, what is going on and what, what the, the potential risks and, and harms are here. And so uh, it's very difficult to get that second half surfaced um, without uh, either drowning it in technical detail or, or rendering it, um, you know, making the, it, it read like something harmless when, when it really isn't. More generally, I think that it's important that we do not turn um, consent on, on the internet into an arms race. Um, because what will happen is if we keep tightening requirements without taking into account the way in which those who want to circumvent those requirements um, will react, we'll end up in a situation in which the people who, who suffer are the data subjects and we get no data protection results from it. Um, and it's really important to understand that, that statistics um, are, are, are very powerful at the kind of scale that we are dealing with. And if we, if we mindlessly uh, create new requirements, as has been happening over the past uh, decade or so, um, we'll, we'll basically create a system in which the rich get richer. Um, those who are the most determined in, in uh, working around um, uh, you know, user autonomy will succeed. And, and so basically the, the worst players will, will, will be the most successful. That is not a good outcome by, by any means. And so we need to be extremely careful in how we specify what can be consented to and what should be consentable. And last but not at all least in uh, this list of issues with, with consent to, to data processing in, in the wild, um, is the fact that privacy is is inherently collective. Um, we we we've we've grown used to to thinking about it purely in um, in individualistic 
um, terms um, and, and consent is, is, is a hyper individualistic solution uh, to, 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 to the problems that, that, that we are facing. Um, but really, uh, at the end of the day, uh, information is, is inherently relational. That, that is what information is. And um, when we learn something about one person, uh, because we are statistically similar, especially at the kind of scales that we are dealing with, then we don't learn something about just that person. We learn something about everyone who is sort of similar to that person. And in fact, um, if, for instance, you are quite similar to, to me and you consent to, to being fully profiled and um, I don't, uh, well, the fact that we read the same stuff means that I can be um, targeted uh, contextually with, with very high precision, um, potentially in, in discriminatory ways or, or, or sensitive ways, um, simply because you agreed to data processing uh, um, and, and the targeting works whether or not um, I, I agree as well. And so we do need to take this, this collective um, dimension in, into account, uh, otherwise uh, none of this privacy, none of this data governance works. Uh, but we absolutely cannot do that with consent. So consent should really be limited to things that are um, predominantly individual. And there are <coughs> many. at this point, it's tempting to believe that there's nothing that we can do, that everything is lost, um, that basically consent uh, because of its, 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 its transplantation issues, its HCI issues, its collective um, issues cannot be fixed. Uh, even with far stricter and smarter um, guidance and, 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 and enforcement. Um, and so, you know, should we, should we just give up? And, and I, I don't think that's the case. I think there, there is a path forward. I think there are, there are things that we can do to make the situation significantly better, but um, uh, they won't be, the, these solutions will not be easy and they will not be problem free, but they, they're still very much worth exploring because this is a complicated space and it's the entire future of data um, that, that we are talking about and therefore it, it's worth getting getting right, putting the energy into it that, that it requires. In doing so, the first thing that we absolutely need to acknowledge is that this is difficult. These are, these are entirely new problems uh, in this space. And this is a story that, that I like to tell because it, I think it, it adds some perspective uh, to, to, to the issues that, that we're facing. When, when homes started to be electrified, connected to, to, to the electric grid in the, in the 19th century, um, uh, a lot of people uh, felt that they could just tap uh, into into the into the grid directly, just like hook their houses up without paying the the electrical company. And you know, from today's perspective, uh, you know, in 2022, it, it this seems uh, unthinkable, or at least it, it it seems pretty clear to us that 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 constitutes theft. Um, well, that was not at all obvious to people back then. Um, in fact, uh, the, the German Supreme Court uh, at the time uh, decided that this was not theft because um, theft is when you take an object, a, an asset from someone. So, you know, if there's a chair and you take it without permission, that, that is theft. But electricity doesn't really fit that definition. Um, and, and in fact, the, this, this topic remained contested uh, well into the 20th century and it, it's only um, I think the last case to, to die out um, in, in this, in, you know, in, in, in this domain um, was in the 70s in the, in the New York Supreme, Supreme Court. And so it took, it took a long time for people to, to understand how to approach electricity as an asset, as something that may be stolen or may be processed differently. And data is even worse. I mean, electricity is somewhat abstract, but data is completely weird as, as assets go. Um, and and it, it, it's going to take a long time for us to, 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 to figure it out. It's going to take a lot of, of thinking. And uh, once again, that, that's, that's all the more reason not to offload that, that, that privacy labor, that, that thinking uh, onto people and just like dump them um, with, with, with like consent requirements that, that they cannot possibly be, be equipped to, to handle. We need to do much better. A first step in doing better is to broaden the angle um, somewhat. And so essentially, uh, privacy is a subset 
of data governance. Um, it's, it's the subset that relates to data that is about people or that impact. <coughs> and so as soon as we start looking at governance, you know, governance is, is, is rule systems and, and uh, governance relies on institutional mechanisms that, that is where it happens. And these institutional mechanisms can decide these rules, they can modify these rules, enforce them, um, and, and essentially create ways and that can be like highly specific for actors um, to be constrained or, or, or empowered in, in, a, in a great variety of ways. And th there's a whole toolbox of governance systems, um, uh, governance, you know, institutional arrangements out there that, that we can draw inspiration from in order to help us with this, with this data protection quandary. Perhaps the most common mistake that we make in thinking about these problems is, is to approach the, 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 the situation as if only state actors or companies could solve it. And this tends to turn us into powerless uh, people who can only be on the sidelines, maybe on Twitter, complaining about lack of enforcement or bad regulation on one hand and bad behavior from companies that, that seem to be above the law on the other. Uh, neither of these are good extremes. It doesn't mean that they cannot help, they should uh, participate in solving the, the, the problem, but we can do better. Um, we, can, we can create in our own institutions um, and, and figure out ways that, that, that we develop uh, institutional arrangements in which some of us can participate, some of us can represent um, others, and through that, build collective data governance that might be highly specific to a, an industry, to a topic, um, but more importantly, is negotiated between different stakeholders. You don't want something where just one type of stakeholder decides for everyone else um, how, how data should be processed. That is, that is what happened 20 years ago with all the ad choices um, systems that, that never worked and, and never delivered anything um, of, of any value. Um, but, but if we bring together and we create the conditions that, uh, that, that multiple kinds of stakeholders will want to negotiate together to find common ground, um, then we can, have a, we, we can start building governance systems um, that, that, that have credibility and that have some degree of agility such that they can, they can evolve over time um, to, to, to match um, our needs as people. If you're listening to this thinking that what I'm talking about would likely make things a lot more complex than they are today, then you're not entirely wrong. Um, the situation we have with, with data processing uh, on the internet is complex, getting it right is difficult, and applying overly simplistic solutions like consent the way it has been done so far uh, is unlikely to produce any kind of, of, of positive outcome for, for, for anyone. And I like to use this, this diagram here because this shows um, the complex interplay of different actors that are involved in forestry management. Um, and it shows that if you develop institutional um, capacity, if, if, if you build your ability, you know, your, your, your collective governance um, capabilities, then you can create a situation in which various contexts overlap and nest and intermesh in ways that create a robust governance um, framework, a robust governance uh, interplay of, of different actors and different systems. And this creates capacity um, for, 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 for successful management of difficult real world problems. And essentially, this idea that we can collectively improve things and with that we can create a thicket of, of governance mechanisms um, that might be industry specific or topic specific, area specific, and that, that, that you know, will, will are designed to support data subjects first and foremost, is what is being uh, proposed in this uh, new W3C document um, that, that is being um, uh, written by the TAG, the Technical Architecture Group, which is sort of the umbrella group um, for, for principled approaches to, to technology. And basically, it, it is trying to frame a system such that, um, you know, data governance can emerge from, from, from various areas of the web and really be built in, in, in ways that, that support people. Um, this, this document itself does not define uh, the, the, these governance principles, but it does offer 
a set of values, a set of, of foundational rules that should be applied across the web in order to improve um, uh, privacy for everyone there. I'm not going to go through this document in extreme detail. Uh, it's not the topic that brings us together today. Um, I'm, but I'm going to look at a few high level principles and high level approaches that it has taken um, because this, these are these are the, the, the ideas that, that frame um, the way in which um, we are considering uh, the, the, how privacy should should be managed on the web um, and, and, and basically give a foundation to more specific, more contextual, more refined ways of, of approaching the, the, the issue. And so you know one of one of the core tenets of this document is that concentrations of data are concentrations of power. And uh, in order to avoid asymmetries of power, we need to, to, to do everything possible to avoid um, concentrations of, 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 of information. Um, and so, uh, you know, the idea is that really we are trying to protect uh, people from, from excessive concentration of information in any, uh, any one single hand. Another core focus of this document is, is really centered on individual autonomy. And Something that some people do find counterintuitive is that um, if you want autonomy, then you cannot want consent, at least not the way, in the way in which it is deployed today. Um, uh, really relying excessively on consent cannot possibly respect people's autonomy because it taxes uh, bounded, bounded rationality way too much um, to, to be autonomy um, in, in enhancing. And so it limits people's uh, agency. And it, it is also disrespectful of people um, to offload privacy labor, which is the work that one has to do in order to ensure that a given type of data processing is, is respectful of, of people's dignity. It is, it is disrespectful to offload that systematically to, to data subjects by, by asking them to consent. And so really, this document does not reject consent at all. It, 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 it supports it where, where it works. Um, but it necessarily has to restrict it to, to, to certain specific cases um, in which it is actually autonomy enhancing. Of course, a key assumption um, behind a lot of these considerations is that data processing can be used for good and regularly will be used for good. Um, if, if we believe that a, a certain type of, of data processing um, cannot be used for good or, or will almost certainly not be used for good, the, the, the solution to that, to that situation is not to require it to be consented. You don't want people to consent to bad things. That's, that's, that's crazy. Um, and, and, you know, because privacy is collective, if a few people consent to something bad, it could affect all of us. And therefore, the, the solution for, for bad data processing, harmful data processing, is, is, is banned. It's, it's, it's outright banned um, and not procedural means to, to, make, it, to make it legitimate. Um, and so, for instance, the DSA has, has some provisions going in that direction, and that's, that's encouraging, even though we probably need, need quite a few more um, in, in, the, in the same vein. And so, but, so the document, um, the, the, the tax privacy principles does uh, consider privacy to be a, a collective uh, issue, an issue um, for collective governance, and that requires collective solutions and not uh, hyper-individualistic uh, approaches like, like, like consent. Um, also, one thing that, that's, that's particularly important to take into account here is the idea that privacy is con context specific, that is something that uh, you will be familiar with from from uh, Helen Nissenbaum's work, but that that is also um, that, that is also brought forward in the governing knowledge commons um, framework um, that has a, a a book about about privacy that has uh, collective privacy, contextual privacy uh, in, in 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 an institutional um, setting with an institutional rules based approach, um, and so this is what. Um, uh, we hope to, to, to work towards um, at the web level. One example of this kind of arrangement of collective governance is uh, the Garuda proposal, uh, which, which I made a, a, a short while ago, and that is, that is, still, being, that is still being discussed. Um, I'm not 
claiming that this is an ideal proposal or that it will it, it will eventually see the light of day. But it's I mean it as as an example of the kind of uh, arrangement and discussion and governance model that we can adopt in order to support better privacy while supporting um, use cases of data processing um, that, that that are valuable. And so here the idea which might sound crazy to a few people is to make um, is to make digital advertising trustworthy or to make trustworthy digital advertising possible. And the <coughs> idea behind Gerudo is to produce a governance model for a, a trusted server. And by trusted, I mean by all parties. So for instance, by people, um, it, is, it has to be one component, um, but also by publishers and by ad buyers. Um, and the idea is to make this, this trustworthy using a governance model that can represent all parties around the table and make sure that they cannot do anything without reaching consensus on, on, on what is good. And so essentially this trusted server makes guarantees of anonymity um, that, that really protect uh, people from being recognized as they browse the web while still enabling a number of, of useful um, uh, advertising use cases. And so the idea here is to, is to introduce this, this sort of third party that everyone can trust and that is uh, managed under a collective governance model. So instead of offloading uh, the difficult work of figuring out what is happening uh, at the advertising level, even in cases that are strongly privacy preserving that, guarant that provide really credible guarantees of, of anonymity instead of offloading that to people um, which is which is unfair in, in any circumstance the idea here is that representatives of the people which are selected in, in a specific way and again I'm not claiming that this is this is necessarily perfect it's just an example of the model um, have to argue and reach consensus um, with with other parties and these no party can dominate on its own um, and even alliances are such that that they, they they can only go so far without a super majority of of, of of all constituencies the idea is really to bring to to, to enforce balance between between different interests um, uh, such that you get a result that might not be ideal for anyone but that is good for everyone and um, and you know this this can be sustained uh, through uh, an, an evolving governance model over time, and of course you know should be transparent, should be guided in, in public, and this this can can be reproduced if it if it is successful across different contexts and in 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 different areas, um, such that we can we can start building this this um, this polycentric. Um, uh, overlapping set of governance models that that really help guard guard data protect people um, but still make um, make useful contributions based on data processing um, in, in in the world of this talk about creating our own institutions and collectively governing um, privacy for 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 you know for better outcomes um, might sound fun but perhaps a bit difficult to operationalize and it's certainly true that that not everything can 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 be done simply by by snapping our fingers but we shouldn't forget that um, existing legal infrastructure for instance in Europe can can actually already support some of this work so of course there's articles 40 and 41 um, on codes of conduct that that could um, help provide some some degree of support for this kind of work but even good old consent itself um, could actually be deployed uh, in a way that that supports collective governance using systems like ADPC um, the um, the advanced data protection control uh, protocol um, we we could have a system where decisions as to what is appropriate what is what should be consented to are made collectively and then people um, simply have their browsers uh, send the right signal to match um, that kind of the the, the 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 decision made collectively by delegating um, the 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 power to consent to to another party and implementing it uh, through this protocol. So this really helps show how how automated signals can really come to the rescue um, of limits imposed by bounded re uh, rationality um, by by automating things um, in 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 favor of of data subjects.
one of the one of the the, the greatest inequalities uh, in in a digital context that that is uh, very rarely discussed is the asymmetry of automation. Um, people who process uh, the companies and entities that 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 process um, data uh, do so in an automated fashion um, across the board, whereas people are made to make decisions manually and to 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 set preferences and 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 to to make manual uh, individual decisions uh, every time. This is this is always going to be unfair, and so the idea that we can use um, uh, a, a automation on the data subject side is really powerful and using that to implement uh, decisions made collectively and rendered uh, binding by existing legal bases um, is, I think, um, uh, one of the keys to, to figuring out how to, how to solve this big mess that we have right now. And with this, I want to thank you for your time, thank you for your attention, and we should normally have uh, some time left for questions, so, you know, fire away. And thanks again. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, and the it. discussion panel already started, I can tell you that. <laughs> and uh, very, I'll start by the very, very end. Yeah, interesting remarks about GPC versus ADPC. Um, it was also something we were preparing to uh, uh, for, for the discussion panel. Um, Pauline will, well, Paulina will have uh, a bit to say about that. Uh, Interesting the context because that is sometimes missed. Indeed, GPC is great to withdraw quick things. It's very, very useful, but clearly cannot cover everything. I think you all agree with me. Okay, but I'll stop right here. Questions? There was one, uh, where was it? about so you advocate from ng so you advocate for collective governance but not using collective consent if it was available for privacy and uh, robin said yes two slides later the answer <laughs> would be there but only partially perhaps you'd like to expand a little bit i, I mean I, I can i can expand a little bit and I, just to make sure that we're talking about this, the same thing um, so I, I'm, I'm really, what I'm really discussing here is cases of you know, relatively broad collective governance. Um, so, you know, cases in which we're, we're, we're thinking about, hey, for everyone who reads, I don't know, news, would it be okay to process their data this way, that way, what opt-outs, opt-ins, et cetera, might be required. So that, that, is, that is one scale of collective governance. I suspect given the, the, what you were saying around your question, but I could be wrong. That that you're you're thinking more about smaller groups potentially consenting together to something. So one of the cases that that's that's relatively typical in there is I decide to to share a picture of a party, um, you know, from two nights ago to social media, and everyone who's in that picture actually needs to consent before that picture gets shared to to anyone else. Um, so that is a different type of collective governance but it, it is also it, it is also uh, a, a form of collective governance the the thing is the the institutional requirements have to be different for 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 both right because in one case you can have something that's like slow and takes you know months to set up and like goes through like long discussions to reach consensus on what kind of of data processing is appropriate whereas like for the for the picture sharing case you basically want something that spins itself up in in a few seconds automatically asks everyone gets you know either accept or reject and then and then shuts down and i suspect you were mentioning genomic data i'm not at all an expert um but i suspect it's somewhere in between where it's like you don't want to like do like a snap thing that's for a picture but but maybe more i don't know but, but, but yes yeah. yes i think that's really interesting so with genomic data, for example, um, you might not realize it, but actually maybe your genome, if it was sequenced, might be identifiable to like a fifth cousin to even farther than that. So actually the group can be quite broad. So maybe not as general as everyone who reads a specific newspaper, but definitely more broad than just a known subset of a group in a family that's more central. And so this has been really interesting to see how maybe there's 
very um, specific ways that they do group consent um, with like indigenous populations for genetic research that I'm more used to, but then seeing how it's done for privacy, which is much more broad. Right, and, and, and I mean, it's great to hear that, that there are people doing research on that because I, I don't think there's an easy solution to that one. It's not, it, it, it's not gonna be trivial. I mean, how, how do you handle cases in which like learning something by studying you know, one person's genomic data might reveal about not just that their family, but anyone who has similar patterns um, that also seems uh, like a potential, potentially interesting issue, uh, difficult one. Yes, that, that's a great question. There's like the whole privacy studies with like genomics and lots of privacy um, that can really happen um, without a lot of people's knowledge. But I'm, I'm more focused on the consent aspect because <laughs> the question's so big. And so do you think that, um, I guess being a little more specific, what are your ideas of um, like a more quick, like individualized to collective consent model that would work for this like collective governance that you're thinking of? Like what are some um, implementations that you're thinking of? In terms of like the, the 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 quick to spin up, I I think you want to build it on top of a trusted foundation that that takes over basically um, you know all of the all of the long term complicated institutional aspects. So <clears throat> you can't. I don't think you can like really spin up something that is trustworthy. Um, that that is just like for you know one flat decision but you can you can you can basically say okay we have this like broader institution that handles consent for this type of context um so you don't it, the idea is like it's not the speed that matters it's not the it's not the, the size of the group that matters it's the, the context matters more and so you want one such institution for one type of of, of data so like genomic data and maybe they will handle some real long-term stuff and they will handle some like shorter smaller group kind of things um but that is basically the 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 institutional infrastructure that will that will help spin up like the, the these these smaller things um and in terms of like what exactly the interactions the ui uh the requirements are on that consent well you really want to make that context specific um and so if it's genomic data i i don't know what the harms are but i assume they could they, they potentially quite serious and so you want to make sure that that is is something that people can't miss um and really focusing like you know the, the things when i mentioned like uh, infre infrequency um, the vividness of, of, of harms uh, and incentives. I think focusing on that for that specific context rather than like building a generic solution it, it, it is really going to be key. But I, the devil's in the details. I can't, I can't tell you like how to implement it in that, in that specific case. Thank you, that, that was very helpful. There's a question from Lawrence about how, Robin, how do you, what role do you see efforts like SOLID or the concept of personal data vaults play in the context of the asymmetries of power you highlighted, in particular, the automation symmetry. I think that's also a very powerful concept. How, how do you see SOLID and the pods and uh, all these complex architectures play in this? I, I, I think, I mean, the, the difficulty is going to make them usable by people. But I do think that as a as an idea, um, there's there's a huge amount of. Uh, I mean, the thing is, today, if you wanted to do something where you control your data, where you 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 can push back on, you know, have uh, automation working for you, there's nothing, right? The browser does a tiny little bit of it. Um, if you're if if you're good at at, at at coding, you can build your own stuff, but it's going to be extremely painful because there are no standards for pretty much anything in terms of data sharing. Um, so something like like <clears throat> like pods, I think, has a huge potential. Um, uh, so yeah, I absolutely think that it is a key component to pushing back on asymmetries of of, of power, be they from information or from automation. 
Um, my two primary worries with, 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 with pods, and this is not to say that it can't work, it's just like what, what the issue is, is one, making them understandable by people, making, making the, the, these things usable, and two, is um, is how to manage the, the the flow of money? It's something that that we we're, we're dealing with um, with other um, other problems. For instance, in, in advertising, I mean, the Garuda system has that issue. Uh, how do you pay for that trusted server? Um, and you know, what, one option is of course having people like subscribe to things, but that is, I mean, I, I work for a subscription business. I can tell you that it's extremely hard. Um, <laughs> and so ideally you want a very thin, uh, you know, a small revenue share to, 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 to flow as part of the interactions with that system. Um, one interesting uh, set of technologies in that, in that area is ILP, the intervention protocol, uh, which is not like blockchain stuff. It's, it's, um, it's sort of like, it's meant to be like, uh, IP, but for money, um, and so it, it, it's. It, I, I think there's, there's there's a lot of potential there, but uh, yeah, we, we have to solve a few problems along the way. But I'm really looking forward to to see more of this. What was the, that last thing you said? Uh, I didn't quite catch the name. That is not like blockchain. Oh, um, ILP, the Interledger Protocol. Um, I can give okay. Um, and the question from Niels as well, uh, who raised uh, hands. So Niels, would you kindly? Yes. Um, so my question is, um, isn't the elephant in the room like, even if we make the ne negotiation about uh, consent and data processing easier with like, um, yeah, like um, group nego negotiation and stuff, um, or technical measures like signals, isn't this like, yeah, like for the most common use cases of consent, like data collection for advertise um, and purposes, wouldn't that not mean like more or less autom automatization of denial of consent and like in you know, the result, like the end of the, yeah, like end of the um, end of personal advertisement? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, there's several strands that I think need to be you know, sort of like, you know, pulled apart in there. Um, one is the idea that the level of data sharing that exists today in advertising is required to make advertising work is not correct. Um, so we can, we can build advertising that is effective, which is something, you know, we want because advertising has to like sustain uh, businesses. Um, so we can make things where um, advertising is effective with significantly less personal data processing and particularly with significantly less data, uh, data uh, personal data broadcasting. Um, and so we can move the a lot of the intelligence to the edges where it's much more um, uh, controlled, auditable um, uh, and, and, and understandable. So yes, this, this entire system in which we have a negotiated way of agreeing on, on what should go into, into advertising assumes strong protections where data doesn't, doesn't like leak otherwise. And it's actually what's happening um, today. There's, there's like significant pro projects um, by a broad segment of, of industry um, to, to like really clamp down on, on the data that gets shared, on data that, get, that gets broadcasted. And that's where the idea is like, is to really go to no by default and not not from legal requirements but from technical impossibility like the things that that become very difficult to, to get through and then open tiny tiny holes where it's required so for instance there's um there's one uh, there's, there's a proposal that has been made jointly by facebook and and mozilla called ipa which is just to do attribution so it's just so that people can measure that ads work and the thing is it doesn't say, you know, it's not going to say like, oh, Robin saw this ad, that that information is not is not something that will become available. It uses a secure multiparty computation and differential privacy to make sure that that information is only, um, <clears throat> I mean, you can only analyze ad performance in, in aggregates. Um, 
And, but the thing is, even if you analyze an aggregate, it might reveal something like there's a 0.03% chance that Robin saw this ad on that site, right? If you, if you really look at everything. Um, and the question we, we have to decide is, is that okay? You know, are we okay with that level of data sharing? Um, and, and I think, you know, with, with that, once you're discussing whether it's okay that someone might perhaps learn that there's a tiny fraction of a chance that maybe you saw an ad on maybe a website, uh, I think we're in a much better place in terms of discussions compared to, you know, where advertising still is today. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other question? We might have 30 seconds left. Okay, then uh, I'll close the session for now. We are back in, I believe, 15 minutes. Um, Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Yeah, welcome to the panel discussion um, on the web of consent on present and future approaches to consenting in websites. Um, let's start with a few introductions. Uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Paulina. I'm a lawyer currently affiliated at Karlsruhe Institute of, Techno of Technology and University of Münster. And um, I have a legal background, but I have been involved in very tech-related research projects for the last eight years and have a focus on yeah, privacy and friendly technology, such as blockchain or ad tech and on data protection. So let me now introduce the more important persons during this panel discussion, the panelists. Um, first, um, I'm happy to have uh, Robin on the, on the panel, our keynote speaker, for those who have not attended the keynote and didn't listen to the um, introduction um, and don't know him. He's vice president of data governance at New York Times. He's a long-term expert in web technology involved in uh, web development and standardization. Particularly, um, he was part of the World Wide Web Consortium, editor of HTML5, and he was co-creator of Terms of Consent. He did choose not to mention in his keynote, namely um, in the Global Privacy Control GPC specification proposal. Um, then we have uh, Romain Gauthier, the uh, CEO and founder of Didomi, that um, is um, a consent management platform. So we have the CMP perspective today on the panel. Then I'm happy to have um, Max Sills here, the PhD researcher at the Security and Privacy Lab at the University of Innsbruck. We are kind of uh, the same research group, even though I'm not in Innsbruck anymore. And his PhD thesis explores um, privacy preference signals. So he gained great expertise regarding the history of privacy signals, uh, current proposals, and has performed large scale analysis of um, the consent ecosystem and um, understands uh, the current consent ecosystem, the TCF, very well. So, then last but not least, we have Stefano here, Stefano Rossetti from. Um, Noib, you're a data protection lawyer and a privacy activist. Noib is uh, the European Center for Digital Rights or abbreviated, the abbreviation for none of your business. And it's basically an Austrian uh, privacy advocating NGO founded by Max Schrems that has recently started an initiative against unlawful cookie banners and also advocates for um, an automatic browser signal, the advanced data protection control, ADPC, uh, where preferences are communicated directly from the user's browsers, and um, that is meant to provide an alternative, a privacy-friendly alternative to cookie banners. So welcome to the panel. I'm happy to have you all. We try to get the DPA perspective too, but they choose uh, not to talk about consent today. So let um, me try to uh, set a little bit of a focus for our panel discussion because there's always a risk of things getting out of hand in such a discussion. What um, I'd like to discuss with you today primarily is whether we can fix consent dialogues as we know them, as we see them in all 
um, websites and uh, secondly if not how we can get rid of them what are the alternatives and just as a starting point not as a, as a main focus of the discussion i want to do I still share my screen no I um, want to take the Belgian uh, decision. Uh, the Belgian DPA has recently imposed a 250K fine on IAB Europe for TCF violations of the GDPR. And this decision blends so many aspects that one should better look at separately that I'd like to boil it down to three aspects and set a focus on only two of them. Um, for IIB, the main thing is that they were found to be a joint controller responsible for the data control uh, processing of the, TC, of the TC string, the consent string, and that they have infringed various provisions of the GDPR. Who thinks they're not a controller, obviously infringes various provisions of the GDPR and might be able to fix these. Also, uh, today we are... Um, co-located with a web conference, very international and um, not a legal conference. So let's not focus on GDPR specific questions or joint controllership today, even though that is basically what I'm most familiar with. I'd like to um, talk about two other things. Um, the Belgian decision has um, mentioned that informed consent to real-time bidding is not established based on the TCF and to put it a little bit broader, that means, or the aspect behind that is maybe some things that happen in ad tech are just too complicated to explain them to the user, or we can do it better. Let's discuss that. Also, I want to discuss one second uh, point. The Belgian DPA said that the TCF lacks security and privacy by design because we cannot tell whether users have created a consent signal and whether it has not been altered in between. So let's um, talk about this. So let's start with uh, the question whether we can um, fix consent dialogues and if so, how? And um, let's start to uh, talk about real-time bidding or things that might be too complicated for users to wrap their head around it. Um, Stefano, uh, from your perspective, could consent banners possibly explain what is happening in ad tech, or is it impossible to explain users what RTB does, what's happening? Well, that's definitely, well, first of all, thank you for, for having me, and hi, everyone. Um, that's the main question. Um, like, the, the essence of information under the GDPR and uh, what does it entail? What are the, the consequences? How much information should be absorbed and digested by the user and the data subject is the central point. Um, well, we know that consent must be informed, free, specific, you know, easy to withdraw, unambiguous. And uh, it is also true that the very recently, like the Court of Justice of the European Union, DPAs, EDPB, um, have given substance to these requirements. And we know, of course, you know, it must be clear, it must be concise, the information easy to understand. Uh, even more so in Orange Romania, a recent, like not, not very recent anymore, but like a decision from the, right, from the Court of Justice, they say it, the information must be digested uh, by the data subject, which means that a practical understanding of like the processing operation is needed in order to obtain a like a proper consent, a consent, a valid consent. Uh, no pressure, no pre tick boxes. Planet Forty Nine. We we know all that. That said, what is the RTB and the TCF? I mean, of course, I'm, I'm not I'm not spending time there, uh, Paulina. But uh, you know, it's a very complex system with a plurality of actors. Uh, there are no clear roles or responsibilities. Uh, no information is available around like VPIAs or like other similar risk assessments. Uh, there is uh, an absolute lack of transparency regarding the downstream processing, what they call the downstream processing, which is basically what happens afterwards the first the first stage. Um, like the DPA themselves have uh, struggled finding uh, sense out of it. 
and uh, well, until now, because this Belgian decision, to a certain extent, uh, move, uh, moves forward and contributes to the to the discussion. At least, you know, it clarifies and identifies the main the main points, the main issues, and. Uh, <laughs> Well, the system, uh, the conclusion, at least how I, I, how I read that decision, is that the system, uh, as far as uh, it is concerned at the moment, it's hardly GDPR compliant. Uh, no transparency, no accountability, no roles, responsibilities, plenty of risks for you know, possible data misuse. And so is it really possible to explain all this uh, very complex data processing operation to an average user? and obtain what is a valid consent under the law. I don't think so. I mean, it's true that the decision leaves, uh, you know, gives the, 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 the IAB a chance to, to fix things. Uh, but to be honest, like the main author, like the, the most known authors seem to agree that the task is at least challenging. And I, I, I don't see how exactly they can fix this. Thank you. Um, Romain, as a CMP, uh, Idomi is giving users information or trying to, aiming to. Do you think that Didomi could explain users what happens in real time bidding in a consent dialogue that are presented with as we see it on all the websites right now? Yeah, maybe I'm like optimistic or naive, but uh, yes, I think that's not the core problem. And uh, if we if we stick to the question, is, is the existing market standard for consent fixable? I think short answer is yes, there is a path for the transparency and consent framework to be fixed. I think the main challenge is that it won't satisfy the interest of all uh, current TCF stakeholders. That's where uh, it's going to be uh, like painful for some. But uh, if you go through the APD decision, it establishes a clear list of points to change, to correct. Uh, uh, it's not saying anywhere that a market standard for consenting is not possible. We've had in the past a clear indication from DPAs that uh, a consent standard is actually a good idea. And, uh, and I, I think that's where we, we, we should limit its role, like some form of technical standards, uh, common language between all uh, internet stakeholders so that they can understand whether a valid uh, legal basis has been established uh, in, in this uh, circumstances consent. Uh, but not to give this uh, standard too much like importance, it should, it should stick to this role. Uh, I think the TCF therefore is coming up with an action plan and uh, is trying to adapt to, uh, to what has been legally challenged. But uh, to be honest, I think it really depends on what you want to fix. Uh, if you want to fix the TCF and the standard with, with respect to the law, I think yes, there is a path. If you, if you want to fix uh, RTB uh, through like uh, fixing the TCF, then no, I think we, we all agree that in its current uh, shape and form, RTB is uh, like, uh, we'll need to like dramatically change and a lot of attack players will need to disappear. Uh, we, we all agree on that. I think as a, as a pure like uh, way to exchange uh, like bid requests and to perform uh, and like perform advertising in a way that is uh, efficient, RTV has some merits. Uh, what uh, I think personally I've always uh, struggled with, with with RTV is the all the like the profiling part, uh, all the aspect that uh, uh, it's true that uh, to some extent some use, some like uh, actors players are using RTV to perform uh, so, like uh, uh, internet profiling for um, for for internet users, and that's uh, that's something that. Uh, needs to be changed um, so yeah I, I would I would like give a nuanced answer so I think yes there is a merit to uh, uh, improve the TCF but uh, if it's used as a way to transform dramatically uh, RTB that's where I think we'll, we'll have uh, done a, a good job uh, and uh, yeah as a CMP maybe to also uh, because it's a confusion that is very often made we like TCF is just one uh, like connector. So uh, I think there is a need for CMP uh, uh, without the TCF. So uh, there is still like uh, the e-privacy directive that is live. So you will always need a cookie consent uh, anyway. Uh, it's the law. So uh, even if TCF disappears, you won't have a consent notice uh, vanish. Uh, so yeah, we need to like be very uh, clear in what we are trying to fix and, and address. And in some sense, I believe uh, 
the, the action of Johnny Ryan is, uh, is not serving uh, everybody's uh, interests uh, and, and, and pushing the envelope in the right direction because it int introduces the confusion between uh, consent and RTB in a way that is not completely uh, um, uh, adequate. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in some way uh, simplification. Uh, and so attacking the TCF, uh, is uh, clearly hurting. It's clearly going to force the industry to change. But uh, if the TCF uh, falls, RTV will still be there. And there is a clear risk of for chaos, uh, which we need to like, be very cautious about. I prefer a world with the TCF. When I click, I refuse. Uh, there is something happening. And, uh, and like uh, honest ad tech players are taking uh, account of my uh, uh, of my uh, of my consent, uh, I prefer that to a world where, uh, which was the like the wild west of the past, and which can come back. I see. You ask for um, concrete aspects to fix. What about the second aspect? Can you, as a CMP, in a TCF as it is, or in a change TCF, um, make sure that um, the consent signals are, yeah, come from the user and have not been altered? Um, it's it's a, it's a it's a good question, but I, I would argue that it's not a question specific to RTB. It's just a question about uh, how no, do I make sure that I have a, the, the effective user in front of me for any uh, like uh, any data processing uh, and uh, and so for advertising processing in particular. Uh, you're right. Uh, I think you need to be, it needs to be balanced with the risk. Uh, and fortunately, we are moving to a direction where. It's going to be harder for uh, technology providers to track users across uh, uh, across the web, and that's good. I, I think that's one thing that uh, is is going to 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 be fixed. And like, I I, th I think technology is going in the right direction there. Now, if you're asking if um, we can provide integrity and security of personal data within the RTB ecosystem, it's a separate question. I'm of the opinion that it's doable. Uh, from a technology standpoint, it's doable. We could trace data, we could encrypt data uh, to a point where uh, we would limit access to personal data within the RTB ecosystem. I think it comes with a huge cost, and the ad tech ecosystem uh, today has like is not able to absorb this uh, investment and this cost. So, uh, I, I guess the outcome uh, will will likely be. Uh, a lot of attack players going away and uh, and disappearing, which is probably a good thing okay. for privacy. Let Max add something on on that. Yes, um, I, I just wanted to get a quick point on this idea that you have TC strings where you make sure they can't be tampered with and so on. Uh, from my perspective, this whole point is very misguided. If you look at um, TCF, if you look at GPC, if you go back and look at do not track, um, all those standards are soft privacy. Like you're sending this to someone, asking them to respect the signal. Um, and the adversarial model where you have that this other person then maybe modifies the standard or misrepresents you, it's just a very, very different attacker model. And I think it's just far removed from what we have on the web. So any kind of idea of adding signatures to TCF and such, I think that's hard privacy topics which won't bring us here any any further. Um, coming back to the point that being fixable, I think I agree with Romain. Um, TCF is a standard built by AdTech for AdTech. It's essentially a reaction to GDPR, making sure that, well, um, we want to keep doing what we are doing. So we make up the standard to keep our current practices in place. And now going to TCF and changing it in the interests of privacy advocates, I think that's like, You've built a tractor and now you're trying to retrofit it to be a race car. Um, it's just not built for this purpose. Um, so um, I think you can fix TCF for ad tech, but I don't think you can fix TCF for the um, yeah privacy advocates. So as you are out of ad tech and in academia and you have uh, wrapped your head around uh, how the TCF has been adopted and spread in the in the web, what are you working on now? How to get rid of it? Do you have a concept for it? If I would want to get rid of it, I would probably need to go into regulation. And as a tech person, there's one thing um, I'm not too keen on, and that is spending all my time on regulation. 
Um, yeah, I think um, like future internet privacy standards will mostly be dictated by governance and regulation. They are not dictated by technical merit. You can design very nice technical standards and call them do not track or GPC. Um, in the end, um, you have an adversary in, in the sense of ad tech not wanting um, signals where users reject data processing and they will try to find their ways around this. So this adoption problem kind of needs to be governed by some regulation, I think. Thank you. Uh, uh, Robin, you, you have pointed out you're not a big fan of consent dialogues. Do you have a vision how to get absolutely rid of them? Keeping in mind that, that not everyone has uh, listened to the keynote also. <laughs> sure, I mean, I, 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 I don't think I want to absolutely get rid of consent in all cases. I do think there are cases in which consent can be can be valid. Um, but, you know, basically the, 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 the power that consent has is about here and what we're trying to do with it in terms of data processing and risks and harm is here. Well, actually I have to point out of the screen. Um, and so, you know, one solution is to try to fix consent such that it can it can reach up all the way, uh, I'll say the screen here, but no one no one's figured that one out and, and, and I don't think we will. So the alternative is to bring down the level of risk to something that is consentable and that doesn't require systematic consent at, with every you know, new website, new app, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, Roma is, is right that under e-privacy, e e we will still need to consent to cookies. Uh, I hope at some point we'll fix that because that is not a great model for anything really. Um, but, um, I do think we can fix consent. So, you know, in terms of, 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 of the TCF situation, making RTB safe should be the, the, first, the first priority. Um, and, and, you know, as Max was saying, you can't do that by, you know, with pinky promises and going like, oh yes, I, here's, here's a string that says, please uh, don't do bad things with my data and hope that, that it'll work, right? So that's why, a lot of the interesting proposals today, and there's there's a whole list of of of, of, uh, of them, are all about making guarantees of anonymity for the data that enters the RTB system. And then, yeah, you have all this like pipes, all these mechanics that can enable bidding, that can enable all kinds of market participation. That's you know that that's potentially very. I mean that, that there's a lot of good stuff that can come out of that if we remove the massive um, uh, privacy privacy harm. And so when you get to that level where RTB is turned into you know basically something that makes bidding work and work fast and work work well um, on the internet, then whatever's left that that might need to be consentable in a website on on an app, um, I think can and should be consentable. Uh, Stefano, Neub is um, proposing an automated browser signal that can pose an alternative to yeah, having these consent dialogues, not getting rid of consent, but getting rid of the dialogues. Um, can you explain how this is a valid mechanism to get rid of cookie dialogues, particularly against the question whether some things are just too complicated to explain to the user, or does it work better with the signals, with the other signals? The, 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 thanks for the question. We are uh, cooperating with other institutions and professionals to develop this um, standard. Um, the point with, you know, a br browser signal uh, basically memorizes users' preferences uh, and continuously sends them out to, to the ad tech actors so that, you know, the user um, decisions are shared and, uh, you know, uh, some processing prevented from happening. It's a great solution. Uh, of course, it requires a wide, widely accepted um, standardization. That is the, the most important uh, problem, I guess, there. And assuming this uh, happens uh, by either, I don't know, a court decision like or some sort of um, uh, agreement at uh, some institutional level or even law or regulation, let's say it happens, the answer is yes. I mean, uh, like a browser signal could definitely help. And it's a, we could define it like a solution, maybe it's a part of the solution, but let me put it in perspective, so to speak. Uh, you know, as uh, some of you, we were mentioning that before Noiba started this so-called dark pattern project, 
uh, which essentially, um, like we question the, the validity of consent obtained through you know, certain cookie banners um, settings uh, when some issues are either visible or uh, detected by, by a computer, our computer, our system. Now, what are these issues? It's like uh, no reject all button or like, uh, I don't know, there's a different ratio, the ratio, different colors. In, in any case, any, any like uh, in a way that somehow deceptively get the user consent. Now, uh, what we know from certain studies, some industry internal studies, is that uh, like if a reject all button is present, is available in the first layer of the banner, the, the cookie, the consent rate, drops by almost like 70, 80%. And basically, this means that if users are given the option to reject cookies, then they do it. Um, and in other words, people don't like to be tracked online. Now, there is absolutely no reason uh, to believe that they would change their behavior, this protective behavior, by using a browser signal. It means that, you know, in the end, even if we would, I mean, when we give users uh, like the option to reject cookies, it's very likely that they will decide to do so, probably rejecting cookies on the on a permanent, uh, you know, continuous way. And in the end, you know, you 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 have the same the same issue like even with browser signals. Not, not, it's it's not from our perspective, of course, is is a good thing. But like in the end, people will, will just reject. I can see people like people using, you know, some uh, the majority using, a, I don't know, a never track or reject non-essential cookies option. And, uh, you know, in other words, it's uh, probably an intermediate um, step uh, as they will most likely entail a practical stop on like the use of cookies. So would be great. I don't know if it's still technically, not technically, but uh, legally, if there are all the, the, all the standards are there so that this can be, you know, um, enforced, uh, but could be like definitely a good option, like a great option. You, you said um, we, we needed a widely adopted standardization, whichever it is. Let's maybe talk about different um, approaches and how adoption can work. Um, Robin, you're involved in the GPC proposal, and GPC is en enforceable under California privacy law. And um, can you provide some insights into GPC adoption in other regions than uh, California, or are you trying to push it there? Yes, yes. I think, I mean, uh, the idea behind the, the the GPC signal itself is is not bound to any specific um, legislation. Uh, initially, um, you know, it, people didn't like my using joke names for 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 standards. So, but initially, it was called Spock, which means signal of a preference for one controller. Um, and and the idea really is that that it's a way for people to convey the fact that they want there to be just one data controller, whatever concept that maps to in in in, in the applicable jurisdiction. Uh, and so they want their data to be processable only by the first party, um, which is not ideal, perfect privacy because the first party could still be doing horrendous things, but at least the, avoid the sharing and selling of data to, to, to further data controllers. Um, that concept uh, uh, translates in California law to the do not sell, do not share uh, rights. Um, similar rights are emerging in um, other jurisdictions in the US. Uh, some of them, uh, so uh, it looks like Colorado is going to have a, a GPC variant, maybe Virginia, uh, Connecticut, is, is uh, apparently in the process of passing um, uh, a law that also has it. So there's, there's progress in, in that direction. And um, on the European front, um, it, it, it hasn't happened yet, but I do think there's a case to be made that, that GPC is applicable under the GDPR. Um, basically, and it doesn't have to conflict with ADPC. You could have both at the same time. Uh, it, 
they, they serve different purposes. GPC is really this simple thing, like give me this baseline, understandable, like the, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas kind of privacy. Um, that is that is that is explainable to 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 people relatively easily. And so, you know, it, under uh, under the GDPR, you could consider that um, when 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 a signal is is transmitted like that, it is a withdrawal of consent. If consent has been given, uh, and it's an objection uh, an objection to 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 processing if if you're processing and the legitimate interest in for all the processings where you are sharing to another uh, uh, another controller than than the, than the than the primary one um is that going to be picked up i've been having a few conversations about gpc and the dsa uh they didn't they didn't pan out uh but uh you know the the i, I will continue having those conversations i know others will as well and if there's interest maybe maybe we'll get something done well now um do you as a CMP have a place in a world without, uh, with, with uh, these browser signals or could you even uh, play a role in, uh, in their adoption? Yes, clearly. I think uh, that's where we can play um, an interesting role because we, we've always, always been in between uh, data controllers and the end user. Uh, and I, I think there is, a, there is an interface needed there. Uh, and so, I, I when I started Didomi, I, I thought, okay, should I develop like some form of privacy wallet that will be uh, uh, enforcing my privacy across my internet navigation? Uh, and a lot have attempted to do that. Uh, even when browsers start to do that, it fails. Do not track in the past. And and the, the truth, maybe the brutal truth, is that most internet users just don't care. They won't change their habits to set that up to uh, configure that uh, initial uh, configuration and they will just be like uh, following whatever uh, default setting will be there and so if you have chrome i'm not sure the default settings will be the ones we all expect uh, so this approach i think is challenging to change uh, to truly change how uh, privacy is uh, is handled over the internet uh, and so we went the other way. Okay, we are going to attack uh, the Everest by the North Face, which is how to change the habits of data controllers. Uh, and so I think we are in between this transformation. In the past, you had nothing. Now, every data controller in Europe, every CUS one has some form of CMP, which is actually blocking a number of things uh, from happening. Um, we've had to make uh, trade-offs uh, in the process. So for instance, we don't enforce any uh, any uh, strict configuration ourselves. We let data controllers choose everything uh, because like, I, I could develop why, but uh, there is a question of uh, responsibility and uh, a and, and number of things we can't just uh, enforce ourselves. Uh, it won't, uh, it would uh, uh, limit our ability to, uh, uh, to, to like, win market shares basically. But now here we are in a, in a place where every website out there a lot of mobile apps, even though it's a bit specific, have implemented this kind of interface by which they can receive uh, signals from the end user and, uh, and, and perform some form of uh, uh, privacy um, uh, action. Uh, and, and that's how uh, we see ourselves at, at Didomi. We think uh, uh, it's the way by which you will uh, enforce a new kind of privacy UX. Uh, consent is one aspect. We, we talk a lot about preferences, which I think Every, every internet user understands much better than consent. It's a legal object, very complex to uh, apprehend correctly. Uh, talking in terms of preferences is the natural language of the internet user for privacy. So it should like, all things should like be co co cohesive. And I think that's where uh, as interface, CMPs have a, have a part to play. And so if it involves receiving signals from uh, uh, some form of uh, like a, a privacy wallet, some uh, like browser signal, I think it's good, it's positive. Now, uh, the complexity out there is, uh, is enormous. So you, you just can't uh, get there with a simple solution. I, I like uh, global privacy control, but what, what, how to interpret that from a, a, a European data control standpoint, there is a struggle. So you, you will have different interpretations across markets, across industries, because interests are very different. So uh, that's how it is. We, we, it's, it's not as easy as it, as it sounds, but 
bottom line is, uh, I think with CMPs, uh, you can have this kind of uh, first uh, interface uh, by which you can adapt uh, how personal data will be processed by data controllers uh, downstream. And that's where we need to like play and, and find the adequate model. Um, Max, what do you think um, which actors a part of uh, browsers could push uh, through um, the adoption of uh, alternative consent signals? How, how about the users? Yeah, I think practically speaking, there are three parties. The first one is browsers. Um, for browsers, you have this obvious competition problem. You have Google with a large market share, and then you need to talk about self-preferencing, thinking about what would they willingly adopt, what would they not willingly adopt. Um, the second player you have is uh, regulators. Um, I mean, people always special on GDPR. I think GDPR had all the best intents. Uh, just underestimated uh, the yeah, adversity of the ad tech ecosystem, which did not like to follow those new rules, but instead made up new um, TCF protocols. Um, and yeah, users are maybe the third party, um, which can do so for themselves using browser extensions, um, blocking third parties um, with ad blockers and such. Um, my main concern with this third approach, frankly, is that um, it works very well for those who know how to do it. Um, and in the end, you end up with like a privileged group of people who is willing to protect their privacy online, and you end, end up with a large um, majority of people who you buy an Android phone at their T-Mobile store, which has Chrome pre-installed, and there is no way for extensions and no way to control their own privacy. So think summing this up, I think um, users, individual users, technical, technically savvy users, they can defend their privacy to some extent, but it's not a solution to the problem. Um, if you look in the past, if we look to do not track, um, you, you can see that ad tech has usually been very willing to support a small number of free riders, a small number of users who are not tracked, who get the same content, who can't be personalized to. As long as this number is reasonably small, you have like an acceptable loss, loss threshold where they say, oh, well, sure, we support all this. Please send your signals. Uh, but once this becomes like a majority, then this whole signal thing becomes an existential threat for some of those companies. And that's why you then very quickly see, well, adversity. Do you, do you, Stefano, think there is a solution um, to that? That um, a signal can provide a better solution without um, just a small group of users benefiting from it? Well, from a, you know, the lawyer perspective, it doesn't really matter. I mean, as long as you um, provide the user with a tool that is like intuitive, and is able to um, protect its interests, his interests in terms of like um, transforming a data processing uh, operation, which was unlawful or irregular before into one that is acceptable under the law, then, then it works. So basically if the problem is like, well, on, on that on that point, to be honest, I also have a like another perspective, which somehow I think I share with Robin because I was I was listening to your previous intervention that if information is too much, if information is too complex, then it's really like consent is not really the legal basis to be used. I have that feeling, um, but but then I mean since we are we are assuming that consent can be still used, then a signal especially if it's, it's, um, it's user friendly and it helps the user to exercise, you know, these basic rights, withdrawal, uh, objection, especially for very simple, like direct marketing uh, and profiling operations, then why not? Of course, there is a risk in terms of like mar marginalizing people which are less tech savvy, but at the same time, again, probably for precisely the same reasons that we are moving against the, the ad tech ecosystem, there could be ways to make this like more intuitive, more, more e easier to, 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 to use. And, and, so, and so bring this processing in line with in compliance with the GDPR. 
Um, Robin had a point um, that makes it questionable that it's not a problem if many users don't make use of um, the option to make choices or set preferences. You um, said um, data protection is a collective matter. So it's a self-determination of the individual that Vito referred to um, before. Is this a solution to that at all, Robin? Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. The 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 interplay of of, of like collective decision making and and personal self determination is 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 you know uh, it's a topic that has animated political scientists for the past you know 2500 25 centuries. So um, so so I don't I don't claim to have like necessarily a, an immediate solution to it. Um, I do think the two layer atop atop one another, where basically collectively provide a, a good foundation that is is you know sort of defaults to something that is uh, I'm not going to say good but decent for for everyone and then you rely on self-determination um, that is empowered by the fact that you don't have to deal with so much so much of the problem you only have to deal with with the slice that that is the delta from 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 the baseline um, and that that makes it that makes it more practical to to support greater self-determination and, and and sort of departure from that baseline if um, we assume that all browsers um, have do not track, do not share, do not uh, personalize whatever as a default. What would attack do about it? Robin, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, Romain, um, could you imagine how users could be incentivized to give away their personal data? Obviously, and uh, I'm sure like uh, probably close to 70 or 80% of internet users would do so without realizing uh, what, what's happening. Uh, uh, the fundamental question is, uh, is is how do you monetize uh, your content uh, without uh, uh, without advertising, without uh, uh, any uh, how do you monetize free content basically? And uh, and no, nobody has an answer outside advertising. Uh, so you could go in the direction of okay, let's make uh, advertising. Uh, uh, respectful of privacy so let's move into like more contextual advertising uh, other uh, techniques with uh, anonymization differential privacy all the privacy sandbox uh, uh, experience now will it deliver sufficient value to the whole ecosystem uh, so that it can like still subsidize free content I'm not sure there, there are conflicting answers there. Uh, if you look at the research, uh, uh, the research that uh, is uh, sponsored by ad tech players is very different from the research that, that is sponsored by privacy activists. Uh, and so nobody really knows. Um, what we know, because we observe that, is that like most people uh, like don't really care. Uh, and so uh, it goes in the direction, okay, we should by default protect these people. Uh, but fundamentally, I think the what we need to transform is the perspective of data controllers over personal data. They need to understand that uh, uh, they they need to give back control to end users over their personal data. The, the risk of not doing so should be high enough uh, that uh, they they don't they are not tempted to uh, to 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 collect and uh, and use personal data in uh, whatever form uh, is uh, is possible today and and that's where i i i'm very much aligned with uh, johnny ryan's perspective let's work on purpose limitation let's make sure that uh, uh, no internet users has ever a surprise with respect to their personal data uh, and uh, and so let's um, make sure that the privacy ux goes in in that direction Obviously, I'm sure ad tech will like uh, transform in a way that uh, because they've always transformed, and so I'm I'm not too worried about ad tech. To be honest, they will find a way out, uh, and and I, I know a lot of uh, ad tech players, people in ad tech, and they are also like individuals uh, very sensitive about their privacy, and so 
uh, working hard to uh, overcome this challenge. So how to make advertising work without personal data. I think uh, the incentive to, uh, to crack that uh, problem is, uh, is just uh, enormous. So I'm sure someone will figure it out. Uh, now let's make sure that uh, the regulation framework that we have in place is uh, correctly uh, implemented, is, uh, is clear for everyone, that there is a clear incentive for every data controller to respect the law, because uh, the, even in Europe, uh, that's the main flow of GDPR to, to date. So it's, uh, it's not taken seriously enough by all data controllers, all professionals dealing with personal data. And, and we, we are in the middle of this transformation. So as uh, I, I consider my role as to accelerate this transformation uh, as much as possible. Robin, you want to react yeah, to no, that? I, I just wanted to jump in and say, it's, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely true that we need to fix advertising. Um, there, is, there, is no, there is no way to, to, to run uh, you know, the internet services that, that we have today um, without a significant um, source of revenue coming from advertising. Um, one thing that I do find interesting is that indeed a lot of ad tech people have pivoted, uh, <clears throat> you know, from like two or five years ago, and that we're now having conversations that would have been impossible uh, really recently. And so, uh, you know, for instance, I, I am invited to speak at the IAB Tech Lab tomorrow, which is like weird. Um, but it's also good that we can we can, you know, finally have I think what I think are, are becoming, um, uh, you know, uh, constructive conversations. And uh, this this you know brings about what I think is a change that needs to happen um, on the side of you know us folks who who have been thinking about privacy and have been worrying about privacy is we're going to have to like be clear and define what it is that we want and what we see what we see privacy really to be and so for instance a lot of people at least you know a part of our community is just like don't use my data at all don't don't touch it don't don't you know don't even think about about looking looking at it um is that is that the solution maybe maybe not um but there's there's other models like for instance if say a, a, your, your 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 knowledge about your behavior is always constrained to one party and never shared and guaranteed to be never shared across contexts um, is that acceptable like for instance you know when i read uh, the new york Times, um, the New York Times thinks of me as, as someone who is uh, very serious about, um, I don't know, crosswords and, 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 and you know, international politics. Uh, but when I go to mylittlepony.com, mylittlepony.com thinks of me as, you know, someone who likes uh, little ponies with purple hair. Um, and these are like two different identities that never get merged. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, that prof that local profiling um, with, with within certain limits is is okay and and can lead to some bidding so long as I can't be recognized. These are all questions that on the privacy side we need to have a good answer for. Like, what does good look like? Uh, what is acceptable? And how do we go beyond just like offloading it to 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 to, to people to decide who who consent? Uh, because on the attic side, they're moving. Um, and it would be good if we had an answer to those questions that that could support that that direction. Yeah, I wonder uh, whether AppTech has an incentive to really scrutinize that assumption that data is the oil. I talked to some AppTech vendors that told me they were forced uh, to target their um, ads by advertisers um, without creating more revenue by it. Um, so how can how can we solve this and get to an economic and privacy friendly situation? Is maybe um, regulation the key? Um, Ste Stefano, do you have um, yeah a vision or a central element that you would change about regulation, about existing regulation, without going into details of the GDPR or another regulation? like from my experiences on the GDPR and the privacy directive mostly. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, like the main uh, issue is the lack of enforcement. Uh, Roman was just saying that it's not taken like sufficiently seriously. Um, decisions come too late, um, especially for cross-border processing involving, involving like structural data protection violations. And 
and I'm, I mean it like also for very simple data protection cases, you know, like uh, an Article 15 right of access violation, which is very simple to assess and, and, and decide on, uh, it takes forever to be decided. So, I mean, as long as we don't have, a, uh, like, as we don't have a system that is able to deliver and and you know just gives these sort of empty promises because that's that's what we can call it right uh then it's true like all this um, uh, ambiguity uh is 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 about to stay you know it's not going anywhere we we are not we are not fixing if like we have very simple principles if we know that consent must respect certain requirements but it takes like four, five, six years to just to just obtain a, a decision from a DPA on the one-stop shop mechanism, and then the, the decision can be appealed, and then maybe go to the Supreme Court. It takes twelve, what, twelve years, maybe, maybe less. I don't know, but you know, these are these are the these, these are the timelines. So <laughs> it's it's really a problem of of like timeliness, even because things are changing. And violations uh, are data protection violations are happening, and we are not keeping up. So mostly that. Thank you. Um, I would propose to invite the audience to ask more questions, and in, instead of leading the whole discussion, because I saw there was some activity on the chat that is already too big for me to look over it. Maybe if someone had a question, they can either um, put on their switch on the camera and ask it to the audience or put it to the chat. Is everyone tired? Ah, so, sorry, I, I'm just looking at uh, you, Roma. You want to yeah. add something here? I, I think like, What's driving change is uh, like uh, enforcement, legal enforcement, but that's not the only driver of change. Uh, and specifically for advertising, I would just uh, try a way to convince uh, advertisers to change because they, they are like driving budgets and uh, and putting their money uh, into like uh, uh, data brokers and, uh, and the whole profiling industry. Uh, I think one thing that is very um, harmful for uh, advertisers is their reputation and as uh, like as uh, uh, internet users that's uh, uh, very easy to uh, uh, to harm uh, an advertiser reputation and that's these are discussions that go very fast at board level and are taken very seriously much more than some legal litigation in uh, in a small european country so i i guess that's that's where also there is a um, there is a like a strategy to to be to be imagined so that uh, brands uh, like feel that it's part of their uh, i don't know social responsibility to uh, to respect people's privacy uh, and I, I see some very uh, positive trends there uh, and 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 maybe that's also going to force change much faster for for the tech industry specifically, uh, and and maybe overall uh, it's probably going to push technology in in the right direction. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, just one small thing I wanted to add because I, I think that's where I think not, none of your business is uh, is is doing a, a great job. I think because it's it's public, uh, the, the general like the public uh, hears about these kind of uh, legal actions. And that's very damaging for the brands that uh, that are uh, like targeted. Thank you for adding that, Vitor. You have a question. Can you um, elaborate on on this on contextual advertising? You want to show your face? Yeah, really. <laughs> I have to click lots of buttons. Indeed. So uh, taking a completely overly optimistic view that I don't believe it myself. Well, all these problems eventually just go away. So GDPR, indeed, so around 2015, it changes everything, right? And consent banners are a problem because of good intentions. I mean, if I, if I allow to be positive like this. So, well, in 10 years, these problems simply go away in some format or, for example, contextualized advertising. I, I haven't seen really numbers, but apparently it is, there's something there. There's good experiments going on and there's positive results. So if indeed things move that way, well, things may just go away. What are the hopes 
of this. It is completely silly a thing to say. Robin is raising his hand. Stefan is nodding. Do you want do you both want to react uh, to that? And I, then Hans has another question, I guess. The, yeah, so I mean, the problem is not going to go away. <laughs> I, think, I think that's for sure. Uh, specifically on, on contextual advertising, um, that would be wonderful if it were true. Um, the problem is when people, you know, I, I get this question a lot, like, why can't you just do contextual advertising? It used to be, it used to be enough, right? Um, well, one, uh, one problem is it was enough for a lot less content. Um, and so, it, you know, we have, we have a lot more to support today. So we need, we do need more effectiveness, but even the idea of contextual advertising is itself, uh, you know, not that well defined. So for instance, are you going to have contextual advertising where the advertising is still served by another party? Is, 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 you know, are you going to have some attribution and, and, and reporting on the fact that the ad was shown, how much, you know, what viewability it had, do you have anti-fraud measures? All of these things are likely to be provided by third parties. And if you don't have a strong model that yet that provides, you know, what, what Max was talking about in terms of like hard privacy against like these, these, these third parties that, that you're going to need to have even for contextual advertising, then you're just back to profiling again. Um, and another issue with contextual advertising with the kind of scale that we have on, on, on the internet is that you can actually make things extremely precisely targeted. Like you can, you know, if you, if you have data about maybe 10,000 or 100,000 people and you watch what their reading habits are, then you can make extremely precise uh, personalized targeting based just on context. You know, someone who is currently reading um, this page at this hour from roughly this geography is going to be, you know, there's, there's like a 70% chance that it is, you know, a black man uh, between 27 and 32. The, the, you, you can get uh, just about this precise, which is almost as, I mean, which is in, in many cases more precise than, than you would get from like broad profiling. So yeah, I, I don't think that contextual is going to solve things on its own. Uh, contextual can help in that by improving by by improving contextual offerings, we can we can uh, get uh, you know increased performance with less data, and that that's something that that the Times has been has been working on. But on its own, it's not going to be a solution to to you know the the big mess that we have. Does any of the other panelists have to add something about that, or are you ready for Harsh's next question? Stefano, you have nodded. <laughs> Do you want to add something? Are you Max? No, I mean, of course I agree. Um, the alternative is a, is a, probably the most complicated part here um, because in a way it's easy to say the system is illegal or the system doesn't work, but then also, you know, what, what, what happened, what, what's next? So that what, what, what I can say from a, like a lawyer perspective is that, you know, there's a, there's a, this, um, constant uh, struggle of like trying to make the reality matching the law and the and the principle so maybe out there there's no perfect solution but what i know is that what we have now is definitely unacceptable because it's denying and and like basic fundamental rights and we do not uh, know yet what the risks are of this like huge accumula data accumulation um so you know that that's why i think you know it's a, it's it's a simple thing uh, the, the law for for us for me is violated should be so the violation should stop and then together with all the other actors and the experts probably find a more uh compliant solution harsh you you had another question or something uh, to yeah. add uh, it's slightly taking it in a different direction, but it is the same question. Uh, here we assume that uh, there is, there's many parties and, and you know the challenge is getting everyone to agree on something. But on the flip side, there is, I would call behemoths who are platform controllers who refuse to play ball with everyone else and they want their own solution, uh, whether it be the way Chrome has been functioning or the way Apple has you know, created ATT. Like, Two extreme examples, one works for the benefit, one 
doesn't work for the benefit. It's very deceptive. But the fact remains that they they don't like to go with everyone. They want solutions that are only working on their own platforms. And it's only going to increase more and more as we go ahead. So is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? How does this affect the ecosystem and the way legal enforcement works? Can I? Yeah, please, Stefano. Um, no, um, it's 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 true. Um, you have uh, you have a like a data protection law that tells you like uh, things should be in a certain way, and and then and then when like uh, these companies seem to go in that direction, then you realize that you have like other very very huge issues in terms, for example, competition law. You know, like all these alternatives. First of all, we don't know if they really are alternatives because, um, you know, to the extent to which a certain technology or solution accesses, uses, installs uh, uh, information on the terminal equipment, it's very similar to a cookie. So the privacy directive, which is technologically neutral, applies anyway. On the other side, uh, I mean, assuming there, these are real alternatives, so not fingerprinting or cookies uh, in you know in disguise, then then you you really have to check what are the consequences of this use for like other 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 parts of the of the legal uh, order such as competition law, because the the risk of like what they call like um, what is it walled walled gardens is really out there right. Um, the, the idea that a certain company with, with a big with a big audience can develop its own like um, advertising ecosystem and go with it, and and th there is no answer. The only answer that that I would see, and like our uh, like our institutions have, re have reacted so far to these problems, is that you have a parliament, a European parliament, a national parliament. Things are discussed openly. You know they are studied and then discussed, and then and then a solution is is found. Uh, it's a, an unstable solution. Maybe it's going to change, but that's the only thing we, the only way we 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 have. I find. I, I think we can do better institution wise. I mean, I, I I do still believe that that you know governmental institution have a very important place to play, uh, and certainly certainly European institutions have have been helping. Um, you know, significantly, but I do think we can we can push forward uh, by increasing institutional capacity um, uh, on the technical platforms themselves, um, and and we need to develop more means for for collective actions as as people uh, and as stakeholders. And so that that is why you know I'm I'm working on this this idea of of, of multi stakeholder governance over over advertising infrastructure because if we can you know get some some collective action and some some partial user um, uh, ownership or governance over over what the money is then we can progressively extend it to to other parts but basically we're dealing with a system in which um, you know the platforms these big mega corporations are providing the institutional backbone for the entirety of our digital lives um, and and the counter power to that is is way too weak and way too slow at this time and i don't think we can expect even you know a large transnational um, government like like the european union to be to be sufficiently powerful to to counterbalance that um, we need we need additional transnational um, organizations in, in support of that and there are models um, uh, for that, I mean, you know, part of part of world trade runs on on that kind of weird uh, weird organization. Um, but we need we we need to to push you know much much further in that direction. I don't think there's any other way that we get a free digital digital world um, otherwise. Um, but also, like enforcing existing laws would be nice. Like I don't understand how Chrome Sync is still legal in in the EU. I mean, it's, it's like a massive violation at, at at incredible scales. It makes RTB look nice. Um, you know, so they, 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 but the, the lack of enforcement is 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 a continued problem. Um, living in Dublin, I can only say sorry. So, any more questions?
Yes, I have one that's kind of similar, but from a different perspective. So do you think that there's enough of a general push for data controllers to protect data subjects privacy more just because you're as the panelists are from very different areas. So for example, there's lots of EU regulations that are changing. So from a regulations industry, consent management platform side, do you think that we're almost there, still needs work from some sectors maybe, or what are your thoughts about that? You can get, get started yeah. if, uh, if no one wants. Uh, uh, I, um, First, I think like we are well too focused on personal data, and I think that's the next uh, iteration of all these regulations, and that's what we see actually happening in, in Europe. But there are also risks outside of personal data, uh, and uh, and and so it's not like called privacy, but there are equally important risks, and that's where I think uh, we need to eventually uh, put our attention. Uh, but how do you control algorithm? Uh, that are not uh, like fed with personal data, but that are impacting your lives in a significant fashion. Um, I liked a lot the approach that we see uh, in the convergence between the EU and US. So let's protect minors. I think I think that's a great start, but uh, but we need to probably uh, get uh, further uh, at some point. Uh, but so yeah, that, that's that would be my answer. So. I think we are well too focused on personal data. Uh, personal data is not really well defined like globally. So uh, that's a first problem. And then uh, there is everything that is not personal data that also uh, cause risks for our digital lives. And so we need to, uh, to make sure this is not forgotten in the, in the process. Do you have examples for that non-personal data? Maybe it's a naive question, but what do you have in mind since so much uh, data is just somehow personal. Um, yes, but uh, like the example by Robin. So if uh, if uh, if you have an algorithm that just like gets uh, a panel large enough to uh, compute behaviors, then it will be applicable to you. And uh, and without knowing, without any of your personal data ever being involved, your uh, what you'll see, what you'll uh, consume, will be uh, directly uh, uh, transformed and changed. And and so I've like no control over that at all. Uh, and uh, and here we are talking about uh, okay, what, what am, am I doing on on the internet? Uh, and it's mostly harmless. Uh, but what ha happens with my like uh, health data and, and and like much more sensitive data is uh, is can, can be really serious, I think. And we can't really imagine like the extent to which. Uh, technology can uh, affect uh, our lives uh, by being fed with uh, any any form of data. I mean, that example, it gets personal, at least at the point where someone says the user with that IP address is likely to be like and between 27 and 32. But before, maybe not, that's true. Uh, no, I would argue that, uh, okay, I, I'm only reading the two, uh, like the two first octaves of my IP address, uh, even in Europe, it won't be considered as personal data. And that's just enough to affect my, uh, uh, and, and it's based off, on, on the time I, uh, I connect. Uh, I think there are many examples. If you really think in terms of adversary, uh, there you have like many, uh, like many flows in, in the way we think about personal data. Yeah, that, that's why I, I cited a bit from the from the document. So the W3C as technical architecture group is in the process of of of, of uh, drafting privacy principles for for the web. Um, you know, full disclaimer: I'm, I'm one of the co-editors of the document. Uh, but one of the things on on which uh, you know that where we're trying to shift thinking about privacy is exactly that: it's it's considering information flows that impact people as being in scope, even if that information itself is not necessarily personal data and it gives it gives a definition of, of, of privacy that then allows us to 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 dig into into issues where you know you, you might be removing personal data or you might be making a case that personal data is being protected because you're dealing with cohorts with because you're dealing with um, guessing things from context etc um, but actually we still consider that in scope for, for for the privacy principles that is not something that has been translated into law yet but it it definitely should be what do you think about that stefano 
like um, I always thought of the concept of personal data as very broad. Would you broaden it even more somehow? To the extent to which like a uh, broader definition contribute to protect the interest and you know the data subject, yes, why not? But at the moment, you know, if you take the, the, the definition of personal data already, it's basically unlimited until like a perfect anonymization is performed, which we all know it's almost impossible, at least with the, you know, all these data contact points and, and, and you know, uh, calculation possibilities. So in many ways, I, I think we are, we are already struggling with, with this definition. <laughs> And which, of course, of course, like this sort of um, uh, non-individual definition of personal data is important. But in 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 a way, from a GDPR perspective, I think that would be personal data anyway, because whenever it relates to an individual, then you the 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 practical consequences are basically the same. Um, Neil, do you have a question? Uh, yes, but um, what do you think about um, like when you when you want to regulate everything about um, data that impacts people via like data protection laws? I think uh, yeah, like the scope is like so massive, so big, and wouldn't it be a, a better approach to um, yeah regulate those kind of impacts at the sectoral level like for example um uh yeah if you have like like an ip address that is first not uh not personal then you combine it with some other data and if it's personal data or not um, um you you see that the person gets a heart attack in 10 years or something like this um but isn't that and for example then that person can't get a can get in health insurance or something like this but it's like the sectoral level the sectoral law like for example like the law um the, how what data what information um the insurance companies are allowed to use to calculate they pre, um they um uh they monthly payment um isn't that a better approach than like regulate everything from the root Stefano, you look like you want to reply to that, or? I, 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 I can take it. I mean, sorry, go. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I think I think this is exactly right. But I think I think you need to articulate to uh, those two things in such a way that they work together, right? You want the data protection law to provide a solid foundation, basically a big toolbox from which sectoral um, sectoral. Uh, you know, uh, regulation can 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 work because you don't want uh, you know uh, in the definition of personal data to be different in say you know I don't know medical data and and insurance over there and 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 you know for like uh, employment law uh, you, you all want these to be, basically have the same foundation and the same goals to operate based on the same principles but then yes ideally you want to create context specific um, regulations and maybe even within the GDPR if we push uh, article 40 41 far enough we could get um, that kind of uh, uh, of regulation negotiated at, at the at the society level. I'm not I'm not that I'm sure that wouldn't work everywhere, um, but it could work in in, in in some sectors. And then you 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 take this this foundation and you you build for for specific sectors uh, things that are that are more precisely uh, defined. Just to um, add a few elements on that, an example more more precisely. Um, there is a new directive uh, regarding like automated decision making and controlling and regulating automated decision making at the workplace. Um, so Article 22 uh, GDPR is one of the uh, most poorly drafted uh, provisions in the regulation, which unfortunately does not always shine for clarity. Um, but um, it's very long story short, it's difficult to to enforce that provision because it's not clear what it entails, what you know what are the safeguards when should should be communicated and shared. it's a, it's a mess. Uh, but then they are trying to uh, they just propose a new regulation on like automated decision making at the workplace. 
basically trying to protect the workers from unlawful tracking, uh, pressure, uh, and 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 you know blackmailing of any sort. There is there are more there are new uh, transparency requirements for uh, those cases. So in a way, you have like a general data protection regulation that set a standard, as Robin said, and then and then you are also, especially in cases where the general data protection regulation is not clear, like more specific sectoral um, uh, regulations and laws. So yeah, it, it, it's happening. And I think uh, given the case and the, you know, the problems with the GDPR, it's actually a good way for now. Although, you know, like specificities in law are never the best. We should have a, like an organic set of regulations that is consistent, but unfortunately it's not always the case. Now we even had a discussion beyond consent, um, namely how big is the scope of that um, regulation where consent is one of the possible uh, legal bases. I think we are at a time where I would invite you to give um, final statements if you feel like. Um, if not, um, I thank you for the extremely rich discussion. Does anyone have anything final to add? Something soothing for our terrorized souls by cookie banners. So I'm, I'm glad that no one um, asked for uh, getting rid of consent at all, because that means we might have a workshop next year too. Let me uh, wrap up this one or close this one by uh, thanking everyone. Thanks to the authors and the presenters for uh, contributing their papers. Um, thanks, um, Robin, for, for the great keynote, and thanks to all panelists for the great discussion in the end, and um, the participants for uh, contributing some uh, nice questions to the discussions. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the other co-chairs that were nice enough uh, to, to, to involve me in the organization team um, this year and uh, who made it fun to work with. Harsh, you have to add something. Ah, it's an organizational uh, question. Yeah, the, pa the panel was recorded, the panel discussion, as you have noticed or been told by Zoom. Is everyone okay with sharing it? Like on, what did you Let say? Me, uh, I give my out in YouTube, for example. So public link, Twitter, and all that broadcasted to eternity. Record their thumbs. Yeah. Opt in. Great, thank you. <laughs> Proper consent. This, this, this. <laughs> Delegated consent, we call that. Was it informed though? <laughs> YouTube. Okay, great. Any other closing remarks by Christiana, Vitor, or Harsh? <laughs> yeah, it was a freely given uh, decision. Harsh. No, Robin. <laughs> okay, great. Everyone is tired. Then I just say goodbye to everyone and thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. To everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Did Paulina leave as well? In any case, yeah, I was about to leave, Harsh, but I think I, I, I read your mind. In any case, shall we go back to Signal? No, wait. Uh, well, you can go. I was asking uh, Daniel uh, about the recording. Um, okay. So he has informed me that it will be made available over the next couple of weeks, and it will be available on the ACMC web channel on YouTube. Perfect. Thank you.